Hello everyone, welcome back to Code with Italians. Today we have Roman back. Hey Roman, welcome back. How are you doing? Good, good. Sorry, I'm setting up my camera. It's so, all right. So stupid, worry. A stupid smart camera that keeps trying to be smart. Ah, <laughs> one of those, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today we're going to be, oh, what we're going to be talking about is tangentially related to cameras, although maybe the simulation of a camera <laughs> more than anything else. <laughs> yes. Uh, so do you want to uh, briefly explain what we're going to be talking about and then even can do the even thing and then we get on cracking? Uh, yeah. So today we're going to talk about uh, filament. Uh, it's a, you can see it here, it's a physically based renderer. Uh, so it's a 3D rendering engine uh, that was started at Google a few years ago. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub at Google slash filament. Um, and it's a cross-platform rendering engine. So it works on Mac OS, Linux, Windows, uh, Android, and iOS. Uh, and it's called physically based rendering because it's a, it uses a series of rendering techniques uh, that lets you create somewhat photorealistic real-time renders. Uh, and so, yeah, we're gonna talk about it today and uh, maybe show you how to use it in, uh, in an Android app. Well, I'm so excited about this. I know absolutely nothing about how 3D rendering works, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning some about it. Uh, Ivan, do you want to do the Ivan thing so that yes. we are ready to go after that? Very quickly, very quickly. Thank you, everybody, for the support. Uh, as a reminder, you can support us in a very, very, very easy way if you have an Amazon. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Gracias, everybody. For el, uh, ayuda, por la ayuda. Uh, come on, man. gracias, Mar. Um, por, por el Ivano. Uh, um, and that I actually, and I, you know what? Next time I'm gonna screw with you, uh, screw you, and actually prepare a Spanish version of this thing. So for now, it never gets old. Yeah, you just like. Anyway, so thank you, everybody. If you have an Amazon sub, uh, Prime subscription, you can um, connect it with your Amazon Gaming and then your Twitch account, and you can subscribe for free to one channel every month. You can support us like that. Um, you can support us on the on, on coffee. You can buy uh, things like the, the metal pin that we have or the, the keychain. Uh, you can support us on the shop if you like my T-shirt. Uh, you can buy a hoodie version or uh, other t-shirts with the, the angry pizza and um, you can become a subscriber on coffee as well and if you pick the right tier uh, the bruschetta tier you can access to the uh, discord channel and the discord channel will be the gateway to our private chat that we have after the episode where you usually meet with uh, Sebastiano, the guest, and usually also Mark is there, and Sebastiano builds the um, thumbnails for YouTube. So you, you can get a chance to chat uh, with um, with the guest after. And yeah, and I that's guess it. with and us as well, cool. if you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Sebastiano is very into affinity or whatever Photoshop thingy that you use, uh, but the guest and me and Mark Ellison are very, very, very happy to talk with you. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Roman, do you want to start? Let's go. Uh, yeah, so where should we start? Maybe I should show pretty stuff first. Uh, uh, I will ask you one thing. If you can set the editor text size to like 20 points so people can read it easily because it's a bit smaller. Uh, yes. Tell me when it's enough. Uh, probably around 20 is usually what we use, but... Yeah, that's probably oh, okay for now. Yeah, I mean, with 20, I won't be able to see anything anymore. I That's uh, what I always say when when people tell me you should make you will the be surprised. bigger. I'm like, I cannot read anything. <laughs> you will be surprised how many people watch this stream on a phone. So we need <laughs> foldable more than you, than you think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'll start by just uh, showing some pretty pictures. Uh, let's see. So here I'm, I'm, I'm just using one of the tools that come with the distribution of filament. It's called GLTF Viewer. So GLTF is a 3D file format. 
Uh, it's a standard, so there's a lot of tools like Blender that support that support it. Uh, you can find a lot of GLTF files online. So just wanted to show you this GLTF file because just an example of like what I meant by physically based render. Right, so you can see it's the same object with just different materials, uh, and you can see like you know you can create like metallic surfaces, wood, uh, stone, carbon fiber, grass, plastic. So lots of like you know very fancy looking uh, uh, materials pretty easily. Um, and of course, filament like beyond the materials, and we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit, uh, can do also larger scenes. So I'm going to load a different file, a much bigger one. All right. And I hope Okay. My computer, this this machine has a tendency to lock up the GPU, has a tendency to lock up the whole machine, uh, and have to restart. So if this happens, uh, bear with me. <laughs> anyway, so see, you know, th this is a, this is a bigger scene. So I'm going to use that scene to like show you some of the things that that Firmin can do in terms of you know rendering capabilities. Uh, so you have access to things like uh, you have anti-aliasing. We have cool shadowing options. So for instance, here we have the ambient occlusion. Uh, you can see hopefully what it does on screen. It adds a kind of shadowing that's coming from the ambient light, not from from, from direct lights. Uh, the screen space reflections that I keep complaining about on uh, <laughs> online. But to make things look better, I'm going to change the camera settings. So you can see here, like we have the camera settings. You can change the focal length of the camera, just like you would with a, a real camera. So you choose the, the focal length in millimeters. So it's pretty easy to recreate a real lens. You can change the aperture of the lens. For those who do photography, nice. you can see it changes the exposure. Uh, I'm changing the shutter speed, the ISO. Uh, so now the scene is too bright. Uh, so I need to adapt the, the, the lights. So I have a sunlight. I'm going to lower it to like a low intensity. And we have the ambient light. So now I have this night scene uh, by just changing the camera exposure. Um, so again, that's what we—that's why it's called physically based rendering, right? I set a, an exposure on the camera that's well suited for nighttime, and then I put low intensity on my lights, and everything behaves properly. Uh, right. So we're gonna turn on a few more options. We're gonna make it look better. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there's uh, there's one of effect here, the bloom. Uh, you can see on the lights. So for instance, on the sign here. Can see the bloom effect it creates this kind of like halo around uh, intense mm -hmm. lights. Uh, we're gonna do. Let's see what we're gonna do. Uh, so I'm trying to connect some fog. Uh, sometimes you know, it, oh, it, nice. It hangs a little bit because the uh, uh, you can change you know where the fog starts, like the density of the fog. Uh, we can pick a color by hand. Or we could say, like, pick the color of the environment. Uh, then on the camera, we can do even more interesting things, like we can have depth of field. Uh, let's see, let's find a good vantage point, like right here. So we're going to enable the depth of field. We're going to set the focus distance. We're going to increase the blur. Yeah, you can see now that we have this, like, the kind of effect you get on, on cameras where, you know, you have a bokeh. I would have expected um, the blur. Uh, uh, blur to be derived from the aperture. It is. It is. Ah, uh, okay. But the blur, the blur scale lets you because the, the problem is like you know artistic reasons, right? Like sometimes mm -hmm. that's not enough because uh, this is a twenty-eight millimeter lens. So if we use a longer lens and then we, uh, uh, we move <laughs> back, then now you can see that the blur is stronger, uh, so it behaves. Again, like a real lens would. And so if, and if right. you change the aperture, the, you can see that the blur in the background uh, is getting stronger, like the longer the lens. Yeah. Ah, OK, OK, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, you, you can do like, you know, vignette effects, like you do in Photoshop uh, to like enhance your scene a little bit. Uh, we also have uh, what's called color grading. Oh, sorry, I'll go back to a wider lens. Uh, and the color grading lets you manipulate the final image. Um, so you can change the tone mapping, 
uh, that's how we map the HDR values that we compute when we do the lighting to like something that can be shown on the screen. Uh, you can do like post post process exposure if you didn't like what the camera was doing. Uh, we built something called night adaptation, so it's it simulates the physical phenomenon in your vision system, in your eyes, in your brain, to like change the colors the way they would be at night. Uh, so oh. if we if we lower the exposure, so you know things get a little bluer, uh, things like that. Uh, and this is actually you know to make this look realistic, you have to use a scene that's you know very dark. But this is you know what actually happens uh, in your eyes when when uh, you adapt to the to the nighttime. You can change the white balance, so you can make the image you know, cooler or warmer. Uh, you have the channel mixers, so you can do like sepia tone or grayscale effect. Uh, you can oh, yeah, that's the, the, um, the Mexico effect, right? When, when yeah. in, in the TV series, everything turns yellow and then everything is now in South America. And we're like, OK, you know, that's, have you ever there? If I didn't know, I would ask you which TV shows do you watch? But <laughs> then uh, there are there are plenty of videos when they change the music and change the light and they the same scene change geography. From a photographic point of view, you know, when they, they do it in movies. Anyway, it just remember they reminded me that. Uh, yeah, and then you can do things like you know sp split uh, split tone mapping, where like you can, uh, for instance, thin the shadows in blue. You can make your eye, your highlights I don't know like orange or yellow, just like again you would in Photoshop and in Lightroom and things like that. So there's a lot of things you know you can change contrast. Uh, vibrance and saturation. There's a lot of things you can do to like improve the image uh, in post-processing. So yeah, you have access to all those capabilities, uh, you know, on on any platform. Um, and then I'm gonna go back to the materials. Uh, so I'm gonna open a different tool. It's called the Material Sandbox. Uh, let's see. We're gonna take uh, an environment and. So I'm trying to remember where I put the uh, my test files. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So this is a, a very simple app. I loaded a very simple object. Uh, you can see that one of the things that Firmin does well is use something called image-based lighting, where the environment itself. So I'm removing the sun here. Uh, so you can see that the the environment, like the background. Is actually lighting the sphere. This is a, a white sphere, but you can see that there's you know a bit of like orange pink coming from orange, the sunset pinky, over there. Yeah, nice. yeah, there's blue coming from the back. And so if you pick a different environment, so this is what I was loading here in the command line, uh, the lighting will be completely different. Uh, actually, let's try a different file. Uh, let's try uh, what's a good one. Uh, the so, sky is on yeah. fire. <laughs> Sounds like a very <laughs> orange thing. <laughs> yeah, you can try this one. Uh, so see, like, very different look. Uh, nice. But if I take, I like this one, Photoshop. So the, um, the resources that you are showing are uh, part of the, the project, the, the repo, is that your stuff that you have? Uh, it's I mean, can people play? With the same stuff that you are doing, or it's a, yes. your uh, environment? Yeah, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, those are all all files that are parts of your project, and you can you know and you can uh, nice. do whatever you want there. There's even I'll even show a website where you can download this kind of images uh, for free. All right. So the materials. Nice. Uh, so in film, the materials they start with the material model. Uh, so we have you know like five of them. We're gonna look at four. Uh, so the first one is unlit. So unlit is an object that you know doesn't have any lighting, so it's just basically a, a base color, uh, and you can't even tell that it's a sphere anymore. Right? It looks like a disc. Yeah, it's pretty no... flat. Right. So for instance, the UI that you see on the left here, it's all rendered with filament using the unlit model because that's what we want, right? It's UI. We don't want lighting on that. Uh, there's one thing that the the the, the unlit model can do. Uh, it has the concept of emissive color. So you can pretend that it's producing light. Uh, so for instance, if we set it to red and then we increase the emission, uh, you can see that you know behaves kind of like a light. 
So mm-hmm. when you have, let's say, a car and you have headlights, what you would do is that in the headlights, you put an object like this that's very bright just to pretend there's a light there. And then you, put, you, put, you would put an actual light, a virtual light uh, as well. So the virtual light will light the environment and this unlit object will just look like the light is coming from there. So it's a massive trick, uh, but, you know, it's a typical it's 3D rendering. <laughs> it's graphics. Uh, all right. So uh, then more interestingly, we have the lit model. So this one has a lot of properties that you can play with. Uh, we're going to start. So base color is just, you know, well, it's in the name, the base color of the object, right? Like that's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have something called the roughness. So the roughness controls the reflections Ooh, nice. on the object, right? Yeah. Um, so if I make, so if the roughness is set to zero, the object is very glossy, very shiny. Mm-hmm. And if you increase the roughness, you can see that the reflections get blurry, you know, as if like, if you were to like scratch the object, uh, your reflections yeah. would get, like, you know, it gets matte. Uh, and so, for instance, if you have like something like uh, concrete, concrete's going to be very rough. But if you have a shiny plastic toy, the, it's going to be not rough because you want these this shiny reflections. Uh, then you have metallic. So that's to create, well, objects that, that look like metals. Uh, and here's the oh, same nice. object as a metal. Whoa, so the difference between a metal and a non-metal is easier to see when you use, let's say, a red color. Um, so you can see that if you have a shiny red plastic, the object itself is red, but the reflections are, they're called, they're what we call achromatic. So the reflections uh, use the, the original color, right? They have the color of the environment. So if you look at the light that's coming from the environment, the light stays white. But when the object becomes a metal, oh, this the is, reflections... This is cool. The slider is, oh, he's getting me every time. Every time you slide to metal, <laughs> it gets me. It's like, oh, this is so cool. So cool. <laughs> But so you can see then, that now, like oh. all the reflections are, are, are red, right? Uh, because yeah, that's yeah. how metals behave. So uh, objects are actually... how much how much how much mathematics is this thing? I mean, this is so much uh, stuff. I mean, yeah. So there's this document uh, available the, online. The reflection uh, is like crazy. I mean, look at the thing. Look at the scroll bar, even. Look at the scroll bar. The scroll uh, bar. Yes. Oh, fuck so, me. So, okay. So, oh, so, <laughs> sorry. What? Oh, Jesus. Okay. Okay. So all the explanations are there, but actually there's one thing thing I will show you. So, uh, because that makes sense. So the roughness, uh, so if you, if you look at the, uh, if we were to look at the surface of an object, um, you can imagine that a a shiny object is very flat. So all the incoming light here in yellow bounces right up, right? Like it doesn't get modified. A rough object, you can imagine, is made of like tiny, uh, what we call uh, facets, that sends the light back in random directions. And that's what causes this blurriness at the surface of the object. So, you know, okay. that's why it's called roughness, right? Like it's smooth or not smooth. Um, and, and the effect is this, right? When you have light, light coming in, when it's very smooth, it bounces right off in the same direction. Wow. And when it gets randomized, it bounces right off. It bounces in, in, in w- with what we call a specular lobe, and that lobe gets wider and wider uh, as the object gets rougher. That's what creates this like blurry uh, visual. Ah, okay, okay. Um, now the the difference again between the metals and the non-metals. It's actually interesting. There are two components uh, in physically based rendering for the light. This is what we call the diffuse light and the specular light. So the specular light is just the reflections. Uh, and in this diagram, you imagine that you know, this is your object, the light comes in. Part of the light will bounce right off, will not enter the object, right? It will rebound. So that's the specular component. That's the, uh, that's the reflections you see here. That's why like, they stay the same, light, the same color as the environment, because they just bounce right off. And then there's the diffuse light. So it's light that penetrates the object that bounces around inside the object and some of the light gets absorbed. And that's why, for instance, when you have a red object, it's because the light went inside the object, the blue and the green got absorbed, but the red made its way back out. Um, and so those are the two different components, the specular, the reflections, and the diffuse, which is you know, the, the, the actual color of the, of the object itself. And when you have a metal, what happens is there's no diffuse light, there's only specular light, but some of the light will get absorbed. So uh, for metal, the green and the blue 
will actually get absorbed by the object and the red will bounce off. And that's what makes a metal uh, looks like metal. All right. Uh, then we have something called the reflectance. Uh, so this changes like kind of like the shininess of the object. You can see the difference. Uh, it's the amount of specular lighting, the amount of reflections the object has. Most of the time, you don't need to modify this. Uh, but if you want to create gemstones, gemstones are non-metals, but they are highly reflective. So if you wanted to build diamond, you would set the reflectance all the way to one uh, to get this effect. And things like water are actually less reflective, so you would, you know, you would lower the reflections. But most of the time, you don't really have to, uh, to touch this value. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, yeah. So then we have, uh, we're going to go back to those, but uh, then we have the clear coat. So if yes. I create a metal and then I make it rough, right? And then I put a clear coat. So clear coat is a second layer on top of the first. Um, and this is kind of like how you build a, a, a car paint, for instance. A car paint is actually made of uh, a base layer that's metallic, you know, metallic paint. Uh, and then on top of it, you put the clear code. So the clear code gives you those non-colored reflections as a second uh, as a second layer. Uh, it's actually not the best. Let me let me go back to yeah, this environment. It's going to be a little better for the clear code. So if we go back to uh, metal, uh, rough, and then clear code. There you go. So you get this like kind of like deep looking shiny paint. Uh, that has those two effects where like there are red reflections underneath and on top of it we have those white reflections. And the clear coat itself can have roughness, right? So you can you can have if you want a matte paint, for instance, you can you can do this. And it's kind of like a modern look. A lot of cars nowadays have this look. Uh, and so you can do this with a, the clear coat. Uh, then if you have a metallic object, there's anisotropy. So anisotropy, by default, the objects are called uh, isotropic, which means that the, the direction of the reflections doesn't change with the viewpoint. They always go back to where they came from. Uh, with anisotropy, you can change that. Uh, and this is, so we're going to increase the roughness a little bit. So now you can see that the reflections are kind of stretched. And that's what you get, like brushed metals. Uh, that, that's how you get that effect. Or if you look at the back of a CD, for instance, uh, that's exactly the same effect. It's like the light, you know, is is bent towards a specific direction, uh, and so you can do this really neat effect. And you can, you know, go one one way horizontally, or you can go vertically. And again, you can play with the roughness to like change the effect. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, then we have, so the emissive color, we looked at it. Oh yeah, so then we have the sheen. Uh, so the sheen is meant to create, uh, it's more for like uh, cloth or fabric. So if I add a sheen, let's see, we're gonna add a red sheen and we're gonna increase the sheen roughness. Uh, so we can create this kind of, uh, so you can see the object and we can add, add a kind of like secondary uh, secondary like reflection that's diffuse and it's trying to simulate like you know if you look very closely at fabric you have all these little strands of fabric uh, that poke out and that's that helps you recreate that effect uh, all right so and then the lead model uh, Using this model, we can do more interesting things. Um, so we can make the object transparent. Uh, so we can vary the alpha. So you know, nothing particularly uh, interesting there. What's interesting nice. though is that if you think back, like reflections are, there are parts of the light that bounce right off the object, right? So if the object is transparent, the reflections themselves are not because they, they bounce off the object. So they're not going through the object, right? So that's, that's, that's how you can simulate glass uh, very easily. Uh, you just let the, uh, you just let the, uh, so let's see if we, if we put a low value here, we're gonna, like, we have something that kind of looks like glass. Glass surprisingly is actually a very dark color. Uh, you're mostly seeing the reflections. Now, sometimes that's not what you want. 
Uh, sometimes you also want the reflections to be transparent. So there's a there's a type of blend of of transparency mode in Firmin called fade, and in fade you can see that the reflections themselves are also transparent. Mm. So that that is not realistic. That's not really what happens uh, in real objects. But sometimes you know that that may be what you want. So we have that feature. Would you use that right. to like make stuff fade out, or is there a specific kind of effect you're trying to emulate with that generally? Yeah, that's that's to make things fade out usually. Okay. Um, and then sometimes you know because people want to match a special look of an object, uh, they, they're also like it's an, an easy way to tr uh, to create. Um, if you think about like uh, gaze, right, like the the, the 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 fabric that you put on wounds, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very coarse. So there's a lot of holes in the gaze, um, so it's kind of transparent at a distance or or up close. And so in that one, you kind of want to use this uh, this fade mode uh, because there's so many holes that the reflections actually don't bounce up because there's holes. So it's a it's a, it's a trick to recreate this kind of fabric uh, okay. or this kind of materials. Uh, but but it's just a trick. Okay, so then we have refraction. Uh, so refraction is really cool. Um, so refraction, uh, you probably remember your 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 physics classes in I don't know high school or something. Uh, so you can change the index of refraction. Oh wait, no. Uh, oh, because I'm doing the okay. So we're gonna do the solid refraction first. So all right, solid refraction. All right. So here we have a sphere. Uh, you know, it behaves like a like a solid sphere of a glass, and you can see like the, the 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 refraction, the light that's going through the glass is upside down. Uh, but you can change the index of refraction, so you can you know remove the refraction, or you can select you know, whatever index of refraction you want. And you can see there are two effects, right? There's the re reflections on top, and then through the glass we have the refraction. So with the refraction we can do very cool things. So the roughness will also impact the refracted light. So now we can do like kind of like a frosted sphere. So we still have light that's coming through the sphere, but you know, it gets blurry because it's going through this very rough material. And you can Google So it's assuming like that it's a field sphere. So it's a, like a solid sphere of glass. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and, and then you can change the transmission. So the transmission, uh, if you set the transmission to zero, that's basically, you're basically saying none of the light goes through the object, right? Mm. All the light is either specular reflections or diffuse light. And then as you increase the transmission, you can turn into this perfectly transmissive object. So it's kind of neat. You can create this like, you know, kind of like a light bulb, right? Like it's a, a, a painted mm. light bulb, but some of the light goes through the light bulb. Mm. And depending on the amount of light that's shining, you're going to see more or less of that, of that paint um, coming through. Uh, then you can also set the so the transmittance transmittance is the it's what colors of light will be absorbed by the object. Uh, so if I set it to red, so now the light that we still have our, our white reflections, right? And the light that goes through the sphere is now red because we're absorbing the red and blue, the green and blue. Uh, but we can set like at which distance will this happen? And then we can vary the thickness of the object uh, to, to control this effect. So for instance, if I said that uh, light becomes red at a distance of 3, but our object has a thickness of 0 0.3, you can see that the light is partially red, but not completely. And then if I change the, the thickness of the object, you can see how, how it affects the result. Um, and you can do more interesting effects, like you know, other colors. Like, them to look nice and you can see here like with the distance so if oh, if wow. we if we become yellow at a very small distance basically all and the object is very thick we're absorbing so much light that the light is basically you know extinguished mm -hmm. uh, and if we change the distance you know you can see that we're going red or we're going yellow and what's really cool is that here we're using a single object with a single property but using textures all those values can be changed per pixel, right? Per per pixel in the texture, you can change those values. So you can do very interesting things by varying, for instance, the thickness of the object uh, over the surface. Uh, and then, yeah, there's a, so there's also thin refraction. So thin refraction tries to emulate a, an object that you know 
is uh, so it doesn't work really well with the sphere. Like with the sphere, it would be kind of like a, a, a soap bubble is a good example where like it's it's hollow mm-hmm. inside. So you know, there's you don't have this effect of the light like being upside down because it's not going through a lot of uh, of uh, uh, a lot of material. And uh, but you can still the effect get the effect of you know, if you increase the roughness, you can get this like nice looking frosted effect. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Then we have those. Uh, then we can go back to the material models. We have the subsurface model. So this one is is a it's a hack. Uh, it's a little bit like like refraction, uh, but it's trying to simulate so light that penetrates the object object and goes through. Uh, but only the light, like not, uh, it's really hard to explain. So <laughs> I'm going to look at the, at, the, at an actual example. Uh, okay. So I have my sphere. Uh, let's see. Why do I have, oh, I have two thickness sliders. That's, <laughs> I think there's a bug in the, in the tool. There, sh- there shouldn't be all those, uh, those objects, those values. Uh, okay. So I'm trying to, so I'm trying to remember how to make the effect work. Uh, Yes. Oh yeah, subsurface color. Here we go. So now I'm going to make the object white. I'm going to say that the subsurface color is red. Okay. And when we change the thickness, so now we're, we're getting like, you know, a tint of red as the light goes through the object. Uh, but it's going to be easier if I turn off, or if I turn this off. So if I look... Uh, Sorry, I'm going to increase this value. So if we look toward the light, it's hard to see. Let me put a higher surface point. Okay. So as we look toward the light, you can see the lights shining through the object. Uh, it's kind of what happens in skin. So if we, you know, again, give our object a white, uh, a white appearance, you can see that as the light travels and comes back out towards us, it gets this reddish tint. Uh, and yeah, and if we bring back the environment, so this can be a subtle effect, uh, but you know, it's uh, it's nice to create like marble, jade, uh, wax, this kind of stuff, because it's not like it's not like glass with refraction, right? It's it's not gonna shine a, a ton of uh, a ton of things through. Um, anyway. uh, and then we have cloth. Uh, so that one, actually, we're going to use a different object because it's going to be easier to see. All right. So the uh, the materials we've seen so far, like they're pretty shiny. The problem is that fabric in general and cloth uh, is a lot softer. So we have a special model for that. Uh, so let's say I pick a dark red, and then I pick a machine. Here we go. So now we have this. Kind of like velvety looking mm-hmm. surface, and you can tweak the roughness, right? You have like more like satin, uh, or you can have something like you know, very, very soft. Uh, and you can also have a, subsur- a subsurface color. So, if you want the light to change a little bit as it penetrates through the cloth, uh, and so yeah, you can do like really not- then you can do things that you know, I don't know if they make sense, uh, <laughs> some parts are really pretty, but. Uh, this is what you would use to create, you know, uh, a cloth or a fabric or stuff like that. Yeah. And it looks uh, even better when you have actual textures of like, you know, jeans or whatever. Because uh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. if you try to create jeans with the previous material model with lit, you're going to have something that looks like, kind of like tar or plastic. It's going to be too shiny and look too rigid. So this will give the like nice soft appearance that you want from from, from clothes. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's like a, a wild one tour of, uh, what filming can do in terms of, you know, rendering different objects, uh, and properties. Uh, and so by combining, by combining all those features, you can create like really like nice looking things. Uh, and we do have documentation. So there's this PDF that's, that explains some of those, pro- the base properties and what are good values to use. Uh, like for instance, here you have the RGB values. Uh, of different metals that it's like they're actually computed from spectral samples. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to write that code. So mm-hmm. they're, they're, those are physically correct values. 
Um, and it shows you, like, you know, for the different, like, uh, properties of metallic roughness, like what it looks like uh, as, you, as you modify those values. Uh, so that's a good reference. And then the, 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 the materials themselves, we have a lot of features. We have this, like, huge documentation about Jesus all the Christ. features. <laughs> yes. Uh, like, you know, the like that's the example of like you know the the sheen or like the, the clear coats here you have carbon fiber and you can make like this this like uh yeah clear coat carbon fiber the kind of stuff you would find in a car uh anisotropy you know looks if you're trying to create like this uh brushed copper uh wow. you can have anis anisotropy or with anisotropy like uh, what i couldn't show you is that you can set a, a texture that that changes the direction of the anisotropy per pixel, so you can create like this really neat, you know, effects that you've probably seen on uh, in kitchens before. Uh, that's how you would do a CD again. Um, there's ambient occlusion that you can bake in texture. So ambient occlusion is a texture that basically tells you what part of the of the material should be in the shadows when the material is lit by the environment. So here you have example of without and with. So if you have cobblestones, right, or or, or that stone. And you, and you specify an ambient occlusion texture, you can really get this nice looking, you know, it, it adds a bit of like micro shadowing, it's static, but it really sells the effect a lot more when you have that enabled. Is this a uh, yeah. screen space or? Uh, no, that's completely baked. That's at the textures ah, okay, level. Okay, okay. So, right. uh, so that- I just realized the, the, yeah, that, we haven't explained what yeah. screen space means. <laughs> it's probably a good uh, idea. <laughs> yeah, so, so some features, uh, Doing computations in 3D is very expensive. So there are many features, like we mentioned, screen space reflections before. Uh, actually, I have an example. Uh, sorry, let me find. What example could I use? Uh, oh, yeah, I know what I'm going to use. I'm going to use this file. So, uh, okay, so here are very shiny objects, right? Uh, but because this is not ray tracing, if you look at this sphere, it's weird because none of the other spheres appear in the reflections, right? They're completely missing because that's one of the limitations of real-time rendering. Uh, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, so you can use something called screen space reflections. And now you can see that the other spheres appear, but if the spheres nice. move off, off screen, you know, if you look at the reflection here, you can see that when the, screen, the sphere on the right moves off screen, the reflection disappears as well. That's because uh. it's a screen space effect. So the only information we have, it's what's visible on screen. So when something is not on screen, we can't use that data. Uh. Uh, and we do it this way because, you know, we have the, we've computed that information. We can reuse it. It's cheap. Uh, so there are things like, for instance, we have a screen guard band. So we can like kind of increase the size of the internal buffer so that it's, it's less jarring. Uh, but that's a huge limitation. And there's a bunch of effects like this, for instance, here, the SSAO. So you can see, if you look at the bottom of this sphere, you can see when I turn it on or off, we get this extra shadow. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are the ambient shadows. And it's called screen space ambient occlusion because we use screen space information to, to build that, that shadow. So same thing, when, when things go off screen, you would see the shadows disappear. Um, so, if, so if the thing that is projecting a shadow goes outside exactly. the screen, you, you lose the shadow as you lose the same way that you lose the reflection. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly it, uh, and uh, and that's and, and that's why you and that's because you are not doing it real time as like ray tracing will do. Uh, or so, yeah, I... we're doing it real time, but we're not ray tracing. That means that you know, for efficiency reason, in real time, like you you only keep the objects that are visible to the camera. Uh, mm -hmm. So to do this properly, you need to keep the entire scene in memory and you need to like go yeah. trace, res, okay. and it's very expensive. So now, you know, there are fancy GPUs on desktop, but you know, the effect, yeah. like you can see the reflections here, like it, it's nice, right? Like when it yeah, works, it cool. works really well. Uh, yeah. And it's a nice feature to have. So here, this is not what's happening. Like even all those things, those materials on screen, they have those pre-baked textures. So to create those micro shadows to always sell the effect, even when the screen space effect failed. You have you have that information, uh, so it's completely fake uh, and not physically correct. But you know it, it helps a lot. Uh, then there's normal maps. Um, so you, normal maps are a way to fake geometry. 
so this is a good okay. example, right? Like if you imagine that's your, like literally those are screenshots I took where I created a rectangle. I put the texture of a, of a leather couch on it. On the left, there's no normal map. And on the right, I put a normal map. It's still just a rectangle, okay. but now you now it looks like there's you know geometry, right? It looks like you have these squares like of of leather yeah. that have volume, but it's just a. There's also three D kind of thing. Right? It feels like yeah, it's but 3D it's, it's it's purely a lighting trick. Uh, and if and you, you look at it you... from the side, you will see it's not actually there, right? The right, geometry. you can see it here, right? Like. Like it looks like you have those those bits of like those pavers, but if you look at the edge of the sphere, it's actually completely flat. Uh, that's because mm. it's using a, a normal map. So it's a trick, but you know, as soon as you're like not really a, very close to the object, like it looks really it, it looks really convincing. Uh, and and that's a technique that's been used for many 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 years in game. Okay. It works really well. And it's very cheap. Uh, you know, uh, and then there's a lot 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 more. Uh, you know, um, oh, here's an example. So the, the, the cloth, for instance, so that's that's a, a texture of, of jeans fabric. And you can see like with a normal model, see it looks very plasticky and, and doesn't look mm -hmm. like jeans. But then when you use the cloth model, it looks softer and gives you the right appearance. Um, yeah, and then there's a number of like other things that you can turn on or off, uh, you know, this like transparent shadows, uh, which is another like uh, trick uh, <laughs> that you should not look at too closely, but uh, normally in real-time render, you cannot do shadows for transparent objects, uh, but we we fake it. Uh, you know, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, so you can read the documentation uh, to sure. build your own materials. You can do a lot. Right. Any questions? Uh, we had a couple of questions from the chat earlier. Uh, one was, yeah. what inspired the name Filament? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's because, uh, they, so the, the, the story is interesting. Uh, myself and two other engineers, we went to work on robots for about a year at Google, and then we decided to come back uh, to Android, but then we wanted to do something new. So for like six months, uh, actually, we didn't even have a desk. Uh, <laughs> so we were hanging out in the library. I think it was the lawyer's library. So they had the library in their building. And we just like squats, you know, a, a table there. Mm -hmm. And that's where we built both filament and constraint layout. Uh, so they were both born uh, during the six months. Because, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do next. Mm. And so filament, uh, I don't know, we're just like hanging out in the micro kitchen trying to figure out a name. And we wanted something that was kind of related to light uh, and that was not taken and that worked in French and English, because in French, the word for filament is filament. Uh, so, you know, it's, it works in both languages. And it makes for, you know, I was able to draw this, this silly logo uh, easily. So there's no like good reason behind it. It just sounded good. <laughs> uh, the other question we had was, which effect take the biggest hit on resources? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So let's go back to, to the uh, so screen space, screen space. Let's run a few of them and let's monitor the CPU. <laughs> the one, the well, one that the, froze, freeze the, the, the laptop. The, CP, the CPU is not going to be the issue actually. Uh, so TAA, so temporal anti-aliasing is, is pretty expensive, uh, but it helps a lot. So if you look at this object here, like this one, uh, you can see it's, uh, I don't know if it shows really well in the video, but it's a bit aliased because it has high frequency textures. And if you turn on TAA, it's kind of like smooth it out. Uh, so TAA is basically the intelligent. Ours is not great. We, it needs a lot of work. Uh, but it's a solution that accumulates, basically blends frames over time to create to create the intelligent. And if you were to turn off TAA in most modern games, they would look horrible and when i mean horrible i mean you can't look at them uh, because a lot of modern effects to be able to run in real time they we do fewer computations but because we accumulate over time with ta we can make the effect look correct uh, so when you disable ta like you know the image would look like super noisy and very grainy and uh, so ta is pretty expensive um 
FXA is not too bad, but you can see like it really helps anti-aliasing. It helps to do what's called shading aliasing, uh, so what comes from the lighting. MSA, uh, MSA, especially on mobile, it's actually pretty pretty good. Uh, it, it has a bit of a cost, but it's not so bad. Bloom's pretty cheap. SSO is not too MSAA bad. MSA is the old school, just render four times bigger, right? Uh, so it's not exactly rendering four times bigger, but basically, yeah, you have four samples per pixel. So MSA, mm. so FXA, okay, so the different intelligence, that's a, that's a good, uh, it's a good tangent. So TAA is this, you know, accumulation over time and it entirely assists everything, but it tends to produce an image that's pretty soft. FXA is an, an image proce post-processing single frame effect. So basically it looks at the image. It tries to find edges and then it blurs those edges. Uh, so you can see it works really well for like those high frequency objects in the back. Uh, but it's it's not going to help you with the uh, what's called geometry anti-aliasing. So the edges of the triangles themselves are not going to be smoothed out. So for that, there's MSA, and MSA will only anti-alias the edge of the triangles. So if you have aliasing that's caused by the lighting or the texture. MSA will not fix that. So often, like you know, a combo of FXA and MSA works pretty well, uh, but depends on on what your app does. Uh, so yeah, SSAO is not too expensive. Uh, bent normals. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details, but you can see like in the back, like what it does. Uh, it's it's really nice effect for quality, uh, but that adds that that can become pretty expensive. And SSAO, like, you know, there's a lot of knobs that we offer, like you can change the quality, uh, you can turn on like high quality upsampling, by default we do it at half resolution, but you can do it at full resolution. So even when the effect is expensive or not expensive, we give you knobs to like, you know, choose how much you want to spend on it. Uh, so screen space reflections are pretty expensive because we're not doing ray tracing, but we're doing something called ray marching. So when we shade a pixel like here, what we have to do is that we we have to pretend that we're doing ray tracing, so we we read multiple times in the the, the buffer in the texture, uh, and that can be expensive. But you know, same thing here. Like we we give like various options to be able to control the quality and the expense and the and, and the effect. Uh, then let's see color grading. So all the color grading stuff I showed earlier, like you know, all this like tone mapping and white balance. So that is cheap because when you change those values, we bake. All those features are baked into a 3D, a single 3D lookup table. So all those features have the same cost, uh, whether or not you use them, don't use them, whatever value you set, like there's, there's a fixed cost for all those features, which is really nice, right? It doesn't matter, like do whatever you want here and it's going to have the same cost. But again, we let you control the quality. So, you know, uh, you can look at the API docs, but depending on the quality you set, we're going to use a uh, a bigger or smaller texture and it's going to be more precise or not. So it's going to change the, the cost of it, but it's actually pretty cheap. Uh, depth of field that we looked at earlier, like to create this, you know, uh, this like bokeh effect, that is expensive. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, so same thing, we don't do it at native resolution, but you can turn that on. You can change the, the ring counts here. That's going to change the quality and therefore the cost. So that, that one's costly. Fog is cheap. Uh, and then in the lights, uh, what I didn't show is that you can you can uh, select the shadow type. So we have four types of shadows. The default one, PCF, is the cheapest, and then they go more expensive to more exp like yeah more and more expensive. Uh, the last two they, they are used to create more realistic shadows where the shadows are sharper the closer they are to the thing that projects the shadow, and they are they are fuzzier the further away you are. So but those are pretty expensive. shadows. Yeah, contact shadows. So, the, well, actually, we also have contact shadows. So, contact ah, okay. shadows are contact shadows are something else. Uh, actually, uh, let me bring up the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of features. <laughs> so, contact shadows are actually pretty cool. Uh, and let's see if we can get them to work here. Uh, all right, so contact shadows. Ah, uh, yeah. So, if you look under the sign here, the menu sign. You can see there's a shadow, but because of the limitations of the shadow algorithms, you can see that under this leg, the shadow is actually not entirely correct. Like it, it doesn't really touch the object. Uh, and contact shadows like kind of fix that. Uh, you can see it on the plant as well over there. 
like there are missing shadows that will appear. Uh, and so contact shadows are kind of like screen space reflections, but only for shadows and much more localized. So they're really for like micro shadows, like at small distances. Uh, you can see them he uh, here when I turn them on or off. So they really help on the chair as well. They really help. Uh, typically in games, they're mostly used for things like shadows on grass or leaves, you know, on the ground. Uh, it's like really, really small scale uh, shadows. But it's also screen space, you said, right? Uh, it's screen space, uh, but because they're so like small scale, usually the fact that they're screen space is not a big deal. Mm. Uh, but actually, yeah, let me show you the different effects. So PCF looks fine, but it's it's pretty uh, it's it's not very precise. Uh, VSM, uh, sorry, I'll move the I'll move the lights. It's going to be easier to see. Uh, let's see can I put the light. Okay, so if we go back to PCF, so yeah, if you look at the shadows uh, project like that come from those like plants, they're very like blurry and fuzzy. Uh, so that's a that's an artifact of PCF. If we switch to VSM, we have much more precise shadows uh, that are better for sunlight because you know sunlight gives you like this this strong shadows. Mm -hmm. But what's cool with the VSM is that you have a lot of control. You can blur them, for instance. So if you want, like, you know, nice soft shadows, you can do that. Uh, you can also increase the quality with, like, different knobs. So, you, can, you, you know, VSM lets you build, like, you know, much nicer looking shadows than PCF. Uh, and then the other two, uh, so those, uh, let's see, PCF, can I, so those contact shadows, let's see if I can get them to, uh, to behave. Sorry. Positioning the light for shadow is always a pain in the ass. Right. Will I be able to do what I want? Uh, okay, pen number of scale. Yeah, it's a little hard to see. Yeah, I haven't positioned the light very well, but that's so cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you look, if you look at but the shadow, that, that stuff gets me every time because it's so yeah, nice. I mean, it's it's so smooth, right? The, the the whole oh, it just moves the source of light. Oh no, the shadow moves, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, look here. So yeah. now with this uh, PCSS, right? Like, so I set the the right values, and with contact shadows, so we have sharp shadows here, and then they become blurry as you go further mm -hmm. away from the object. So this is more realistic, uh, but this is also way more expensive. Uh, then there's something yeah. called cas cascade shadows. So that that's independent. Uh, that's independent of the type of shadow algorithm. Uh, but what it does basically creates multiple shadow maps. So this is a debug view. Every color is actually a different shadow texture, and you can like position them so that you get like better precision for shadows in your scene. Uh, and they... so. Are those splits uh, frosted aligned or? Uh, they are frosted aligned, yeah. So, so let's see if I change the cascade. So look at this shadow here. Uh, so with one cascade, it's pretty blurry. And I went back to the base algorithm in PCF. But if I go to four cascades, you can see that the shadows are getting better because now we have more texture, so we have more precision. Um, and of course, you know, all those things we enable, like they increase the cost. Uh, so it's really like up to you. You can see also on the wall, like no cascade versus four cascades. They're all yeah. shadow maps techniques, right? They're not those are pre -based. Those are all shadow map yeah, Like no, if something were, was techniques. moving, the shadow would also move. Uh, yes, those are all dynamic shadows. Okay, uh, and that's why, like when I move the lights, you know, right. You know, the shadow. So cool. well, look at this thing. It's so cool. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, I don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah, I yeah, like yeah. this guy. It's fascinating because you know it's something for me. It's so much. It's so complex. From a, how do you render that, right? How do you compute <laughs> where everything? It's, it's, There's a long web page I can point you to so if you want. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the nightmares. But I understand that it's it, it feels like oh yeah, it's just physics. But from a I mean, you don't think about, oh, that's a lot of physics when you just walk around in, in the real world, right? Because, well, that's okay, right? There is a star at some point, there is a shadow. 
but on a, yeah, th like th something th artificial being so accurate, you know, it's the, well, the, the part that I like. So remember when we uh, talked about shaders the other day? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yes. Th those are the the, the filament shaders. Uh, and so for instance, I don't know if we look at, so, you know, we looked at the, the, lit, uh, the lit model earlier. Uh, so this is, uh, sorry, the yeah, standard. Uh, <coughs> that, that plugin for IntelliJ is not great. Uh, so yeah, here like we have the, the code that computes, you know, given a light, uh, given the light and the, the different properties of the pixel, like, you know, metallic roughness and all that stuff. Uh, that's where we compute uh, the lighting uh, f for that object. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of math all over the place. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, things that... We, we talked about I mean, ambient, if... ambient occlusion. So, you know, like here you, you see there's code, where, there's code where we do like per pixel, we are going to compute like the intersection between a cone and uh, uh, and spheres, like to be able to figure out like what's what's shadowed or not. Uh, this is, what is this one? Oh yeah, this is the screen space ambient occlusion code where we have to read a bunch of textures. But yeah, there's a lot of like, it's <laughs> a lot of things happening. But the, the, the code and the comments, they also are interesting because, you know, there are to do's or there are where well, we should do this and should we should do that. And that gives me the, 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 the feeling that the thing is still alive, right? You know, that it's, it's never. And it never ends, even if it's just a lot of math that you, you know, you we can just replicate the math and it will work, but then you can still constantly optimize things, I guess. I'm just guessing here. But I, I yes. saw a couple of comments where you can, oh, yeah, we should do probably this other thing. Um, well, because sometimes the thing is we're not even sure, like, what, what we want to do, right? Because uh, there's a lot of, like, different ways of doing things. Uh, and, you know, a good example, like, uh, so even something we do, do I have an example? So I'm looking for, because sometimes we do things differently, whether or not you're on desktop or mobile, because uh, like here, for instance, uh, on mobile, like this is when we compute the lighting, uh, we, we do the computation differently than on desktop, uh, because on mobile, we do it with like, uh, less precision in the floating point mass. So we have to do the math differently uh, to make sure that it still works on mobile. Uh, whereas on desktop, okay. we can afford to do it you know, the, the right way. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of like, or if you look at the, the design here. Uh, when, when you say mobile, because this is cross platforms, right? Because I, yeah. I I got it. So when you say mobile is more like, okay, it's just because it's a phone or because it's just not plugged to the electricity or it's more like because it's a small display. Or... Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, and you know, the lines are getting blurry, but basically what we say is that if you target OpenGL ES, so that's WebGL and the OpenGL on phones, uh, or your target metal mobile, uh, then we consider that's, that's mobile, right? So there's, okay. there's going to be like low-end phones and high-end phones. And so there are some things we do, like a good example is uh, in... Uh, when we compute the, so the directional light, um, you know, like the, the, basically the sunlight on desktop, we do extra code to treat the sun as a disc instead of as a point. So, you know, it's extra work that we have to do, but what's nice is that in the reflections, you see an actual disc, uh, where, where the light hits the, hits the objects, which is more realistic. And actually we also give you, uh, controls. Uh, so you can change the size of the sun in the sky and that will like, you know, and it will change nicely on the object itself. Um, but on mobile, we're like, you know what, this is a bit expensive and it's kind of nice to have, but it's not like that important. So on, on mobile, we just skip it. Uh, so yeah, it's the kind of stuff that we have to do all over the place. Uh, and then, you know, another thing we do a lot, is like, you know, you can see this kind of comment, uh, of, of, of uh, tests in the code where what we call variant. So when we compile the shaders, we compile multiple variants of the same shader that have different features enabled. So for instance, if you don't enable shadows, we're going to create a shader that contains none of the code for shadowing. That way we can be more efficient when you have shadows. And so currently, I think we have uh, maybe a hundred and no, let's say around a hundred variants 
And so when you write one shader, we actually comp we actually generate a hundred version of the shader, and we pick the right one at runtime uh, depending on what we need to do. Nice. So that's actually nice optimization right there. Like you know, there is a lot yeah. of toggles and a lot of if else. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, to, to give you an idea, like uh, so, here I have uh, let's see, I have we have a, a so we have a tool called MatC that comes with Firmin. That's what compiles the shaders, and then we have the tool called MatInfo uh, that lets you inspect the compiled material. So here, there's a very simple shader that I wrote for a demo, and if I look at MatInfo, uh, so here those are. All the shaders that we compiled uh, for wow. this for this material, right? <laughs> and here you can see the combination of, of features. So this is like directional light plus uh, punctual light. Uh, ah, that's for skinning. Yeah, that's all, like, <laughs> yeah. Like for instance, you know, do you have fog enabled? Do you have directional light and fog enabled? Uh, okay, and okay. on top of on top of this, like our material system, you can. Uh, when you compile a, uh, a shader into what we call a material. So here we have uh, only mobile materials, uh, shaders, because that's what I told the tool. But you can build a single binary that contains the shader for Vulkan, OpenGL, OpenGL ES, Metal. So you can have a single blob that contains the shaders for like yeah. all the platforms, all the targets, all the variants. Uh, or you can, or if you know what you're targeting, you can save on, space, on disk space and say, no, please compile only for, I, in this case, I, I said OpenGL and mobile. I know where Cause... this thing is running on, and so I don't, I don't need that, the other stuff that I, it won't work. So but yeah, I, I like the uh, look. If I so here, if I recompile the same, yeah, if I recompile the same material, but uh, yeah, so now oh, you can see eighty three. Like, She's now is yeah. eighty three. It was forty one. So <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, okay. and actually, it's interesting. It compiled only. Let's see. Uh, Oops. Uh, no, that's the wrong tool. Uh, let's. Uh, so I don't even know how to use my own tools. Uh, ta -da -da. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. So yeah, by default, we compile only for GL. So I'm going to recompile this material for. That might take a. A while, okay. Now that's info, and yeah, so that's the the mail shaders. Uh, so there's eighty three mail shaders, then eight like eighty three probably yeah Vulcan shaders, Vulcan. then the GL shaders, yeah. Nice. Uh, and of course, like the file is pretty huge now. Uh, okay, so it's, it's gonna be larger. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it's uh. So that file is two megs. Jesus, uh, is, it, is it megabytes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, because it, it contains, you know, all, all the targets, right? Uh, yeah, but yeah, now, yeah. if if I recompile it for just mobile and just OpenGL, now it's uh, it's yeah, three, ten times smaller, kind of. Yeah, amazing. that's three hundred k. Okay. So you know, it's a uh, does not, and we try to we have compression schemes inside, like to, to keep those small, but you know, it's a. Uh, that's nice. the point of being cross-platform. You need to target everything. Well, I mean, it's it's that's the the advantage too, right? I mean, that you can mm -hmm. target everything. And actually, part we of have... the of the, the complexities that you know we write those shaders in a GLSL, but so then we had to build this tool like MatC that takes this and compiles it for the different languages. Uh, Does it like cross-compile uh, to? Yeah, so for what we do, thankfully, we can rely on, on libraries. Um, so we use a series of libraries. Uh, there's GLSlang. Uh, that's a, a GLSL parser slash compiler. Mm -hmm. So a, we, we use it to like, you know, uh, well, parse the file and you know, we do our own sauce, but also like to validate the syntax and all that stuff. And then you can compile to something called SpurV. So SPURV is an intermediate representation, it's binary. That's what's used by Vulkan. And then there's something called SPURV cross that takes the SPURV and then you can convert it back to OpenGL, uh, to Metal, or you know, to SPURV for mobile or desktop. 
And on top of this, we use Pervy tools uh, that contains an optimizer. So we run optimization passes on the on the shaders. Um, and so if I look, so if we go back to the mat info, you know, uh, we're going to look at one of the shaders. So let's say we're going to look at shader number five. Print GRSL, five. So that's what the code looks like now. Uh, because it removes wow. like you know all it removes all the dead code. It tries to like optimize things. It removes all the functions. Obviously, you know this is unreadable, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can turn off optimizations if you need to debug. But you know this is what we do to the shaders. Uh, and you can see the shader is now like you know it's maybe a couple hundred lines. But the non-optimized version of that is probably like a couple couple thousand lines. But most of the code mm -hmm. is is, not, is never going to run. So. It's nice to run the the, the, the optimizer. So, do um, you do you have a huge difference in runtime beyond uh, like size, uh, or is it mostly about so storage? It, it's it's storage, but it's also more. It's a couple of things. A, the shaders have to be compiled at runtime uh, mm -hmm. on your device. So, the smaller the shader, the faster it's gonna go. It's gonna be. Uh, so that helps with the compile time, uh, the runtime compile time. Which is a real, a real thing to say, um, and it also very often helps work around driver bugs. Surprisingly, ah. um, so yeah, that, that's one of the reasons we do it is because it has the side effect by simplifying the shader a lot. It has the side effect of making compilers, you know, behave better. <laughs> huh. I would have never thought that optimization would have fixed. Buggy drivers. <laughs> yeah, and as the, the reason is because it simplifies it, right? There's a single function, uh, mm. so there's a lot of bugs around like function calls and passing complex parameters and stuff like that. So ah, it okay. just it just helps the the, the drivers. Uh, so yeah. So, so by inlining any everything to death is like. Yeah. So yeah, shaders are a massive pain in the ass. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> and uh, I remember the, that when we talked about shaders the other time, and you were saying, "Oh yeah, when you need to debug shaders, then yeah, you the, paint yeah. pixels red." So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So actually, in filament, we built a. We have not quite a shader debugger, but uh, there's a way to build filament where you can you can open a web page uh, that will show you all the active materials in filament mm -hmm. and all the active shaders. So it's kind of like Matinfo, right? You see all the shaders and you can edit the shaders in the web page. Oh. And then when you click a button, it sends them back to filament. So when you're working on the shader, you can just iterate that way directly in the engine instead of having to like go yeah. back, you know, recompile and all that stuff. That's cool. Like a, re a ripple for <laughs> filament and shaders. Yeah, well, of course, of course, the problem is that once you wrote the code you wanted, like it's not going to save it for you. So you need to <laughs> you need to make sure you copy paste it somewhere. We should fix that someday. But that's, you know. That... <laughs> At least put uh, a big minus... banner. It's like, oh, yeah, any changes are not saved. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should save. Yeah. We also have uh, we also have on the uh, to, on the the website, which is a terrible website. Uh, we have a remote control. Uh, we have this little app that's that's actually pretty cool. If you if you run, we have a sample app called uh, GRTF Viewer, and you can connect it to your phone. And you know the UI that you have that you that we saw earlier, like uh, where is it? Uh, the UI we saw in this little app. Uh. On the phone, we don't really have space you know, to show you all that stuff. So what we built instead is we have this WebGR version of Filament that <laughs> renders this UI, talks to the phone, and then you can drag and drop files on it, and you can you know move all the sliders, and it's going like, to control nice. the phone. Uh, nice. So yeah, it's... <laughs> Tooling, man. Tooling. Uh, yeah. I, we, I, we want to, I want to do this thing, and we don't have space. Let's build some tool for this. <laughs> yeah, we don't have... We don't have nearly as many tools as I would like to, but you know it's because uh, oh, yeah. it, it's it's a okay. it's a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, and you know, like uh, so, I mentioned GRTF earlier. I saw a bunch of examples. I showed a bunch of examples of, of GRTF files. So we do have this uh, online GRTF viewer where you can uh, drag and drop uh, GRTF files uh, just to like you know test them. No, but uh, but, I, but I like the, the 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 previous one that that doesn't have the save. Because that's look that looks like a like a pull request that I can work on, you know, that I don't 
I don't understand anything about the, the graphics, but maybe I can do a copy paste uh, to your code board, you know, save to file or something like that. So it feels yeah. like a good first, first pull request for me. Uh, yes, you know. Uh, yeah. All what right. Is this called? Did you just drag and drop the thing? Yeah, uh, okay. the, the online GRTF viewer. And, and yeah, it's, it makes it really easy for us okay. to, to test random stuff. Yeah, because so GRTF is a, a file format that's that's standardized by Kronos. So Kronos is the mm -hmm. a committee, they're, they're behind Vulkan and OpenGL. Uh, and here, I'm, that's their, their repository of sample files. So those files like test all the features that you can think of that are part of GRTF. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, it's very often how we nice. test the wow, is, be, cool. is, is behaving properly. Yeah, and some of them look really nice. Some of them are, you know, not that pretty, but uh, others are kind of nice. The older uh, ones... Uh, Velvet sofa, fans. Oh, the test yeah. machine, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are some features that we haven't, uh, that we don't support yet. But, you know, this is a good example of like metallic versus roughness, metal versus non-metal. I have a question. Uh, do you do screenshot tests? <laughs> uh, I would like to, but we don't because it's, uh, yeah, this one, I really like this one that showcases oh, nice. transmission. You know, there's a, there's there's a mosquito. Park. And... <laughs> yeah. Actually, the this one. Background. This is lo right. I love it. Look, I'll, sh I'll show you. This one looks actually really nice when you have the right environment. Uh, but I can't drag and drop. No. Uh, IntelliJ. Computer says no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? Do we old fashion way? Uh, yeah. yeah. What's cool about this one is that uh, you see when there's like nice lighting. This is so cool. Ah. Yes. Um, uh, there you go. The sun behind. It's really nice. Nice. Um, so what was I saying? Uh, sorry, I forgot what we were saying. Oh yeah, and and GRTF also supports animations. Um, so there are. Is it loading? Yeah. Okay, that's not a very Impressive <laughs> animation. Do the do the sci-fi helmet. Do the sci-fi helmet. Uh, sci-fi helmet. Uh, yeah, actually, that one is a uh, let's say classic. Will it load? Maybe it won't load because it was a, a separate file. Because uh, uh, it needs like a compile into single file. Uh, uh, yeah, for the web version. Uh, yeah. yeah, this one's cool. This one uses a bunch of different. Yeah, there is, there is so that, there's there is the, clear uh, code, there's so, sheen. <laughs> yeah. There is also uh, the, the, um, the lights one. thing that we were discussing. Uh, where is my... I don't have the best drone. Sorry, I was looking for an animation, but... I, Porsche, uh, McLaren, I, I see a this. Pagani. I see a... I sense a pattern here. <laughs> it's like... Well, no, no, like a, a tiny bit of animation. <laughs> Oh, it's moving, yeah. Breathing. Uh, uh, let me oh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, actually, it might be better in this one. Uh, yeah, so in this viewer, animation. Oh, uh, no, there's, on, there's only one animation, so. Ah, I forget which files we, use, we, we typically use to test animations. But anyway, so you can have animations in, um, in your GRTF files and, uh, you know, it's nice because then you can have access to the animations in the code, and mm. you can uh, you can easily like you know, uh, decide which animation to play uh, from your code. Yeah, it's an interesting animation, but you can do stuff like that. So yeah, the uh, uh, GRTF is a very very nice format. Like, it supports a lot of stuff, and then there's a website. I think I mentioned last time maybe with Sketchfab. So there's a Sketchfab. lot of uh, yeah. Uh, it was bought by uh, by Epic, uh, mm. but it's actually a French company. It's actually a French company. Uh, so it's it's a way for artists to you know showcase their their work. But what's really cool is well, a it's a lot of very pretty things, but b there's a lot of like files that you can actually download for free. Oh, um, nice! 
Hmm. And you know, some, some of them also, you, you have to pay for them, uh, which I highly encourage people to do. So I've done that a few times, like, you know, to test with nice models. Uh, but what's even better is that, you know, let's say, I don't know, you love those Elvish goggles. Uh, well, that's that one you have to pay for. Is there a free one? <laughs> Uh, you love them, but you don't sure. want to put your credit card info on a live stream. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, sure. Gone, free one, uh, this guy. Uh, so yeah, then you can click Golden download. Night. Okay. Yeah, and then when you're signed in, you can download as a GRTF file, uh, and then you can use that directly in Firmin because you know GRTF being uh, this like standard format. It's uh, pretty impressive. In... Yeah, it that's, is a lot of... that's a lot of work, my friend. I mean, I yeah, was yeah, no, more no. curious about the pizza one that I see on the. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if the pizza one is paid or free. But uh, I, I'm sure you can you can try the free. But see, there's big stuff like you know, a whole class. Yeah, this is actually so, a lot of lighting there. Yeah, you can find a lot of really nice models for free or not. But you know, there's a lot of guns in cars. Uh, for games. Just a lot. <laughs> and and swords and uh, this. And there's there's a the guy from shipping. Yakuza as well, just in case. Yeah, the you the, need to redo Yakuza gun, and filament. <laughs> guns, guns are a big thing, I see. Uh, but yeah, like a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, tests that I'm using here, I come from yeah. come from uh, Sketchfab. It's it's really nice. Oh, nice. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, years. Spartan, Spartan, is it like a warrior? No, or it's the, like... no, yeah, it's the, the guy yeah. so earlier. Ah, okay. It's the, yes, the, the... Spheres are not very interesting. <laughs> the, the, the interesting yeah, but for they, me... Yeah, they are a nice <laughs> use case, you know, showcase of things. So they, they work well for that. So when yeah. you are implementing things, do you have like a ground truth to compare against, like different renders or something? Uh, yeah, actually, sometimes. Um, like, for instance, in the documentation, we mentioned it a little bit at the end. And, uh, at, at first, like, we, I used Grand Truth, like, with path renders. Uh, well, I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah, here. Like, you know, there's a, there's a comparison here between a, an offline path. You know, like, this was rendered in 1 minute and 42 seconds, and this was rendered in filaments uh, in real time. Uh, so it's... Uh, Not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, I mean, it's a very simple sphere, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not particularly interesting. But yeah, so there are, we use ground truth. Uh, I used in the past, uh, again, in the early days, uh, well, actually, you can see like the picture in the back here. That's actually a photo of the of the office I was in at the time. So, you know, those environment maps, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, I create my own. Uh, so, you know, with a camera, you can recreate those environments, so you can recreate the lighting, and then you can compare that, okay, when I set the exposure of the camera to, you know, f2.8 with the shutter speed of that much, then the lighting looks correct. Mm. Uh, I also have actually right here. So, it so sounds very low effort. Uh, <laughs> setting, up, setting up a real world environment to actually test. Yeah, that, I don't think you can screenshot testing that, right? I mean, it's a, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a little harder. Uh, and so here, for instance, I have a, a light meter. Uh, so you use that to like measure the well, the light. You know, like it's gonna tell you like a thousand lumen, two hundred lux. So I use that so that I can then recreate the same lighting in filament. So then I can compare like what shows up on screen versus like what I see. You know, if I if I recreate the environment. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of important like, uh, doing this kind of stuff. There was a, I don't have them anymore, but <laughs> once we went to a, I expensed a bunch of fabric uh, for work. So we went to a fabric store and, bu and bought a bunch of fabric so that I could, you know, when I was doing the fabric shaders. I, I thought uh, for a second you were going to say you expensed a lot of cars. <laughs> I yeah. wish. I need to compare. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we need to be sure that this Lamborghini looks the same. Yeah. So I need to. <laughs> I need. To... No, I, I wish. Uh, I wish. Uh, I wish I could have done that, but uh, no. At least a Leica. <laughs> uh, that's a 3D model. That's not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you need but to. Yeah, yeah. You can buy the physical Leica M, right? And and then just compare. Yes, that's true. Well, I do have one, so that's... <laughs> but yeah, and then, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff, like, you know, again, trying to create, like, physically-based rendering. So here, for instance, we have the math, of, like, when you want to set the color of, of a light, uh, you can give us the color temperature you want, and we're going to compute the correct RGB, or, you know, as close as we can. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you say, okay, the sun is, like, 
6500 Kelvin, uh, you tell us that and we're going to compute the color of the, of the sunlight. Uh, so a lot of, uh, yeah, and, you know, lights themselves. So, oh yeah, yes, the pictures of the, <laughs> the light meter at work. So, so for lights, for instance, we use, so we use physical units. Um, so the sun is going to be in lux, uh, and then point lights, spotlights are going to be in lumen. Uh, and so it's kind of cool because if you buy, you know, uh, a light bulb, uh, you can look at the packaging and it's going to tell you how many lumens it is. Uh, and you can plug that directly in filament. And again, with the right camera exposure, it's going to behave properly. It's, going, it's nice. not going to be perfect, but it's going to be, you know, as, as good as we can make it. Yeah. Legit. So w when it comes to all this math, is mm -hmm. it like the things that it's, uh, it's, it, we have it, right? So it, there is no research from your side on that, on that side. It's just something domain that we, we know that from, from physics and dom like Wikipedia kind of knowledge. Yeah, there's a, yeah, a lot of it is like, you know, it's not new. Uh, it's, a, you know, those things have been researched for a long, long time. So there, there's no like, uh, uh, sorry, a nice example of screen space reflection, uh, giving you like yeah, that exactly. straight lighting on, on the wall. Uh, and you can see how it disappears when we're not at an angle because there's no information. Uh, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, uh, looking looking online, finding the right papers. Uh, so I do have, if, uh, if I launch my error note uh, to give you an idea. Uh, Wikipedia, for instance, was fantastic for all the, the light units uh, and all the light equations, like they were all, all available there. But yeah, so those are the... Oh, wow. <laughs> see, like, and every one of those notes is actually like a paper uh, or, you know, a complex article. So I have, we went through a lot of those things uh, to, to get to filament. And that's partly why we wrote this document. It's kind of like, okay, we read all those things. Some of, sometimes they're hard to read. Sometimes, you know, there's different ways of doing the same thing. So which one do you pick? And what we wanted was a document that if we lost the source code of filament, more or less, we should be able to rebuild it uh, because, you know, we, we explained every equation where it came from, uh, why we picked that one and not a different one. Uh, and some, sometimes the research, like, you know, here, for instance, for class, part of the research, like I didn't come up with those equations. But part of the research was like, you know, I actually mixed several papers. Uh, so I picked like different equations from different papers to obtain like the look I wanted. And sometimes it's not just about the look, it's also like uh, having something that, that feels natural. Uh, like when you play with the sliders, like, you know, to have something that, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that makes sense to the user. Uh, and then obviously there was, you know, the part about optimizations, trying to make it work for mobile. Like sometimes we have to like tweak things a little bit. So we have some tweaks and variants of like you know common equations, but yeah, I think there's this no like might be fundamental the research. Best documented code project I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, well, thanks. It's impressive. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it was a lot of work, and you know, uh, it's not entirely up to date. But I think there's th there's areas that we still haven't documented, like the subsurface model or the fog uh, or the post processing. But you know, it, it takes a lot of time to like write all that stuff. Out of curiosity, uh, so is it is it like a LaTeX uh, document? Uh, no. How do you do the mount? Or do you do the Markdown version of LaTeX? How how do you do it? So it's uh, I use something called uh, MarkDeep. Um, mm. Is it? No, that's the HTML version. Let me load. Um, that's Out of the curiosity, HTML. it's just the... Uh, let's see, where's the md.html? Yeah. So here's the same document, but if you look at the source, uh, view pictures. Um, so it is a markdown document. Uh, okay. But at the end, it, at the end, it includes a bit of JavaScript that's called MarkDeep. Uh, it's an open source project, and it self renders itself. Uh, and what MarkDeep does, it adds a lot of features to Markdown. So in particular, okay. it gives us, uh, you know, uh, so we, uh, not the sections, but things like uh, those nice tables, uh, the all the equations, uh, being able to reference. So like in the code, when oh, I nice. it, so in the, it, it automatically creates links, it, see, it puts numbers on the equation. So in the, in the text, I can say like, 
please refer to equation and then I have a label and it creates a link uh, automatically to that equation or that figure. Uh, uh, and if we go uh, to the MarkDeep website, actually I highly recommend everyone right. looks at MarkDeep because Yeah, it's... actually I right now I know <laughs> that Mark Ellison is thinking what I'm thinking and yeah, this is so good. Uh, this is so nice. I mean, yeah, you can that yeah, you can you can have like calendar quotes, uh you know, lots of control over pictures, uh, but the parts I like the fact that oh, yeah. it, it, Look at it that. renders the page so you can have the reference to the figures. Yeah, but that's what I like one of the things that I miss the most with the yeah, with markdown it's, it's, and then I it's really smart. So for instance, when you put an X, like if you write a resolution, you know, ten twenty by, by ten eighty. Like the uh -huh. X is automatically rendered as the multiplication X, not as oh, the letter man. X. So it does like same thing with the minus signs, the degrees. Uh, so if you if you write forty degrees, it will replace the word degrees with like you know the uh, that. Oh, that. this have, is actually very smart. Yeah, you have code block. You have you know you can do like uh, formatted output, like you know command line output, and you can do this. Is that like, like and, mermaid or like what or mermaid, like mermaid? Yeah. Look, all uh, no, it's all custom JavaScript that someone Whoa! wrote. So if you, you, should, you should do ASCII what? diagrams, they turn into fuck? that. It's I know, like it's ASCII. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's all it's all ASCII. You just draw your diagram what in ASCII. Yeah. No, that thing is fucking amazing. And what I love about how, it how is that you, how was it? It's like Mark Deep. Mark Deep. Uh, and again, it's just a JavaScript. So you you write a Markdown file, and at the end you add the script tag, and it will self render. And then I, I I created on GitHub, I created a project called markdeep-rasterizer. And what this does is it generates the the final HTML uh, so that way it loads faster. Uh, so if you want to present, you know, a pure HTML page that doesn't have JavaScript, you can you can do that. Uh, but yeah, no, markdeep is is really, really awesome. Uh, and you know, and it's you can embed markdeep in existing pages, it has like templates. Oh, this thing is crazy. I mean, we need to. We, I need to look into this because, wow. And what's partially, yeah, and what's particularly nice about Markdeep is because, uh, since it's a, it's kind of an HTML like you know document really. But even if <laughs> you look Gantt, at us, if, the Gantt doesn't make any sense. The Gantt diagram yeah, but, just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> So you can read it, you know, the source code is readable. Uh, if you yeah. have a markdown viewer, like it's mostly going to work. But what I love is like, like in Filament, we just have, you know, those documents are just in the source tree. I love the yeah, idea yeah, of yeah. having the documentation right there in the source tree and you don't need to run like processing on it or anything. You just, you, just, you can just read it and edit it. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's an awesome project. Uh, I do uh, recommend yes. everyone uses it. So yeah, and you can yes. see like, and also it scales, right? Because the reason why I switched to MarkDeep is like originally uh, this was all written in a Google Doc, uh, but, <laughs> but Google Doc. I mean, know, once we, well, I mean, once we reach like you know 100 pages, and especially with all those equations, and I, and I get it, right? Like Google Doc was not designed for what we are doing with it. Like we are doing a lot of equations, uh, yeah. but you know, it's uh, look, you can do like tables with equations in them, and no, yeah, it's yeah, and the presentation good. is really nice. Like it's. Yeah, but that's that's why I, I ask because you know this kind of stuff, this kind of uh, paging, uh, like la paging layout, I yeah. I still have PTSD from from college and LaTeX and that kind of stuff. So I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the it, guy the guy built a three D rendering engine. Maybe he's using LaTeX. <laughs> and I was like, no. So then you know that that was like that was a nice thing to to hear. <laughs> Like humans, like <laughs> right? he's a human. So, <laughs> so at, at least, but this is like a clever, a clever, clever alternative. But the the result, the outcome is basically the same. And this is this is very nice. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. And look, the uh, so the way it works, like those link points. Since you say like, uh, 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 where is the yeah? So see, if I said. The implementation of the Velvet Bubble is presented in listing, and then I put this label, and then somewhere I have, you know, so I have the snippet of code, and then you can put a caption, and I say listing, and the same label, and the label, and then you will automatically, yeah, then you will automatically generate like you know the the numbers for you, like. Uh, All right. Also the link. Yeah. There is also the, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the link. Yeah, it, it creates. Oh the link. yeah. 
it, it does that for images, for equations, for like uh, uh, bibliography. So at the end, like it generates, you know, you can generate this bibliography table and it creates the links as well. Like it's, it, it makes for a really nice document that loads, you know, look at like the, it loads really quickly. It loads in a couple of seconds and it's a massive document. Like, nice. So this, uh, this thing is that's the, the treat for you. inside the treat, Sebastiano. <laughs> we had a, <laughs> a great episode that ended. It's like, okay, this is so. Now, <laughs> now this is even something yeah. else. I love it. I love uh, it. Yeah, and uh, you know, and all of our documentation. So that that was written in Markdeep as well. So it's really it's really good to like create you know if you need tables and notes and warnings and uh, you know it's it's really nice. If only, if only. Okay. I know what cool. you're thinking about, even. I know what no, you're I'm thinking dying. about. I'm dying. I'm dying with that <laughs> thinking. It's it's me, Mark Ellison, and we are tomorrow is gonna be. Oh, yeah. Did you? Yes, Mark. No, we can't. How <laughs> about? <laughs> so no, it's what it won't happen. So yet. So that's uh, that's. But I like it. Then now I have a new tool for my stuff that is actually very very powerful. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And that and this PDF is uh, Affinity Designer. That's uh, that's very different. Oh, uh, okay. and you were asking about research. So the other thing uh, that we've done a lot is you know, so we didn't quite come up with uh, our own equations everywhere, but some of them. And so the other tool that we used a lot is Mathematica. Uh, you know, to like. Yep. Mm -hmm. Test our equations and uh, is there like a true academic? Uh, <laughs> yeah, like a true right. academic. Yeah, but uh, I had some. But I had some. Oh yeah, Oops. like for instance, that was to like uh, compute. You know, I mentioned like computing the RGB colors of metals. Uh, so I was exploring that to figure out like how you integral like how you integrate like uh, uh, spectral samples and stuff like that. Uh, and then a lot of the work we've done, like you know, is trying to find like approximations for some of the equations. Uh, can I run? Uh, and I have Whoa. this love-hate relation. I have this love-hate relationship with Mathematica. It's an amazing tool, but uh, sometimes it's a uh, yeah, it's a little hard to love. <laughs> I remember using it in UNIF. And never, never used Mathematica. Yeah, it has to. I used MATLAB at the university, so yeah. So MATLAB, MATLAB is, is easier because, it, well, MATLAB is more like a traditional programming language. Yeah. Because Ma Mathematica, like I mean, you know, it's like everything you get used to it, but it's uh, obviously it's for math, so it's more functional. But the syntax, oh my god, uh, let me see. <laughs> no, you, you have no idea. Let me. See no, I, I have. Uh, but this one explode. I mean, look at this shit. Like, yeah, I was actually thinking, but is it actually the syntax that is? No, this, this, no. <laughs> like, it was like pound, pound bracket x ampersand slash at. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> cool. I mean, it's yeah. cool. It looks like Objective C. It looks worse than Objective C. <laughs> really? <laughs> but it's incredibly powerful. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's been uh, it's been super super helpful to have a. Uh, to have that, uh, to have that tool, and actually, all the, and <laughs> the more, the more, once you pass the trauma, then it gets very powerful. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's it's more, it's less the trauma. It's more like you feel like more than in any language. Like I always, I'm always stuck because, uh, yeah, it works very differently, and yeah, you spend a lot of time on the uh, what is it, math exchange, the Stack Overflow of math. Uh, <laughs> But you know, there's always someone always has the answer to your questions. Just you have to yeah. like go, go know how to ask your question. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, and all those for those who are interested, like uh, all those uh, notebooks are in our source tree as well. So oh, they're part nice, of the nice. yeah, they're part of the source code. Uh, yeah. So yeah. well, we did so, we did some research. Just a few. Yeah, yeah it's not some. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Damn. Oh, so much stuff. Nice. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, the so if you look at the source tree for Android developers, so we do have a few samples. Uh, so the libraries are on, on Maven Central. Uh, 
we have so this filament dash android that's just the engine itself then there's grtfio that's the loader for grtf files uh, so you don't need it uh, and there's filament dash utils so this one gives you the grtf loader plus a bunch of like you know random uh, utilities uh, like quaternion the, the the remote server that i was mentioning for debugging uh, your phone like an easy way to load texture stuff like that um, and then we have a bunch of samples so the samples if you look at the readme uh, they are in a certain order so if you follow mm. them one by one so first we learn how to do a triangle then how to do uh, a cube with lighting oh, nice. uh, then we have a live wallpaper then you can do image-based lighting so you add you know this environment uh, to do the lighting then how to like add textures to the object uh, you can do transparent rendering uh, using a, a surface view or a texture view. Uh, how to use texture view, how to build the materials at runtime, how to load the GRTF file with animations, uh, how to map the camera to a cube, you know, st stuff like that. So, you know, all those examples. And the API, so if you want, we can take a quick look at the APIs. Um, I'm going to load, uh, I'm going to load a different ID. Android Studio. Okay, kill this one. Uh, what is it? Loading? Okay, it's the right. So yeah, you can load the uh, you can load the uh, the the Android directory of, of filament in Android Studio directly. And then it's done syncing in Gradle. We can look at the APIs. Because uh, yeah, even you you asked about the assets earlier. So we have three mm -hmm. types of assets. There are three types of assets. So one of them is what we call the IBLs, uh, or environment or image-based lights. So they are those you know, three D photos basically of the, of the environment. Yeah, so the warehouse, the, IB... the, the right. beach. So if you go to polyheaven.com, uh, all those Polyheaven. files. Yeah, so all those files are under CC0 license, so you can use them as you wish. Uh, and there's, yeah, see, there's 600 of them. So, you know, you have outdoor, sunset, uh, you know, indoor, like, dawn, urban, clear skies, like anything you want is going to be in there. Uh, okay. And so what you do is you, you download uh, the file, so it's going to give you an EXR file. Uh, so that's the, and those can be really big. Uh, 300 megabytes. Okay. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Because that's there a are a lot of information. Are, yeah. Because it's a 16 or 32 bit per mm. component because uh, it's HDR, it's HDR images. Uh, and actually, if we don't. And very high resolution, those, I can imagine as well. Actually, yeah, I have, yeah. uh, and inside the film and source tree, we have a few of them. So if we look at, uh, I don't know, like this one. So that's what they look like. Now, what's cool is that if you have Affinity Photo, uh, let's open that in Affinity Photo. If it starts. Well, yeah. You are opening everything at the same time. So uh, I, have I, 96 bet gig I have 96 gigs of RAM. I'm fine. OK. so. <laughs> Because of course uh, it's not. <laughs> it's not gonna choke. Uh, it's just it, affinity that is slow. Yeah, it's it's my it's my Mac Pro. It's uh, it should be fine. All right, so uh, shut up. So there is this. Uh, I always forget where it is. Uh, where is that feature? Uh, crap, crap, crap. Uh, oh yeah, live projection, equirectangular projection, and now okay. inside Affinity Photo, look. Oh. Can, you can see the environment as if you were in the middle of like you know a sphere, yeah. and then you can you can edit the you can you have access to all the editing editing, editing tools as if you are painting this 3D image, and that's very important because uh, if you go back to uh, to the normal projection, see what's annoying is that at the bottom everything is stretched. Mm. So when you want mm -hmm. to do modifications, mm -hmm. like I don't know, you want to remove the tripod or stuff like that, it's really hard to do. So you can go to this projected mode. Do your your painting in there, and then go back out, and it does all the projections for you. Um, but anyway, so yeah, in, fil in filament, uh, when you have one of those files, uh, 
you use a tool uh, that you can download from our GitHub pre compiled but there's a tool called CMGen for CubeMap Generator. And you basically give it that EXR or HDR file, and it will, if you do fktx dash x, uh, so dash x means, you know, deploy, so you give it a directory, uh, and then you give it the, the, the input file. So it will process the, uh, the file uh, so that Firmin can read it. Uh, okay, let's, let's try to do it uh, so that you see what it looks like. Uh, so we're going to put it uh, in desktop. Let's see, uh, flower road, and then third party flower road. Okay. 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 So it's doing a bunch of things. Yeah. And then in the directory, you have those two files, <coughs> two KTX files. So KTX is a, a texture format. So it's a standard. Skybox is the what you're going to use for the background, and IBL is the actual light in data. Uh, so it, it has been pre-processed. If you were to look at what at those files inside a, a, a viewer, they wouldn't make much sense. Uh, but you know, there's been a lot of processing, and we have to compute like stuff yeah. like this for the lighting numbers. Uh, yeah, but you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about it. Um, <laughs> and what's interesting is that if you look at some of those files, like in a so there's this open source tool called HDR view. It's a really nice viewer. Uh, you can see the histogram, the values of the pixels are between zero and 391,168. So if you zoom in on the sun, uh, keep zooming. Ah, crap, you can see the, because uh, when you keep zooming, yeah, you can see the value of each pixel. Uh, uh -huh. But uh -huh. it doesn't like why. So when you look inside the sun, the values in there are like 300,000. Uh, and so that's why we do all that processing, uh, because it gives us the actual intensity of the light, right? Uh, oh, wow. that, that encodes the actual intensity. So something in the shadow will be zero and the sun itself will be like 300,000. Uh, so from that, we can derive actual light, realistic looking lighting. So that's one type of asset you need. The set of, second type is meshes. So Firmit itself doesn't have uh, a mesh format, really. Um, but we do have an example. So if you look at the samples, uh, textured object, um, we have this class in the samples called mesh loader. And it loads a very simple type of file that you can generate using a tool that we provide as well called Fila Mesh. Uh, <laughs> and you give it, <laughs> yeah, we have Fila Mat, Fila Mesh. Uh, and you give it, it's very simple. You give it a, you give it a, a, a an OBJ, for instance, which is a very common uh, 3D format. It will sp speed out this Fila Mesh file. It's optimized for fast loading. It's optimized for uh, mobile rendering. But it's very simple. It's not. It doesn't support animations. It's not going to have the materials. So the textures you have to provide yourself on the side. Uh, but we have a tool for that, and we also have. If you look in the source tree, uh, if you look at the readme, uh, the format is very simple and it's fully documented. Um, but we do have a loader written in Kotlin that you can use. So that's one thing. Otherwise, use GRTF because GRTF, you know, I showed you like. There's tons of materials. You can do animations. You can have lights and cameras. Uh, that's the that's the easier thing to use. Um, but in general, like the way filament works, uh, just to give you the basics, we're going to use at the look at the uh, at the cube example. I think that's that's a good uh, it's a good thing. So first of all, you have to initialize uh, filament. Uh, so all that does is that it loads the Geni library. Um, you know. So you could do it, you could do that yourself, but you have to call firma.init. If you use the utility library of firma, you have to call utils.init. Um, should have picked a better name, it should be called firma loader or util loader or whatever. But you have to call this init function. Uh, then you need a surface view to render in. Could also be a texture view. Uh, you need a choreographer so that just to schedule the frames. Okay. Then we give you something called a display helper. Uh, so the display helper is what we use to, to control the frame rate. Because one thing I didn't show is that we have the concept of uh, dynamic resolution. So that's a feature you can enable. And what, we, what, what happens when you use dynamic resolution is we watch the frame time, how long it takes to render the frames. And if it takes too long, 
we're going to smoothly reduce the resolution on one axis than another until we can reach your target frame rate, so typically 60 frames per second. Uh, and that means that you know your rendering will adapt to whatever device you're running on, which is going to lower the resolution uh, yeah. based on the GPU. So it's a very common feature in games as well, but it's really helpful on mobile, especially when you enable you know more fan like fancier uh, rendering features. Mm. So the display helper is something that we need. It it taps into some of the Android APIs so that we can do that uh, for you. Uh, then we have another thing called the UI helper. So the UI helper is doesn't do anything magical, but basically it's going to manage the surface view or the texture view for you. Uh, so you know if you want your texture view, your surface view to be transparent, it will take care of that for you. If you want it to be above or below, it's going to take care of that for you. So it's not complicated code, but just things that you don't want to deal with. So you create a UI helper, you you create a callback. Uh, so UI helper will call you in the callback, and then you can attach the helper to your surface view. And if you look at the callback, there's going to be three of them. One is, okay, there's a new surface, so there's a new rendering surface, so that happens, you know, the first time the surface view is created, or if the activity is destroyed and recreated, that kind of stuff. Uh, when the surface is detached, so typically when we destroy the activity, and then when the surface is resized. So typically on... When the surface is resized, you're going to change your viewport resolution to match the resolution of the of the surface view. You're going to also change your camera projection to maintain the aspect ratio, uh, or you know do anything else you want on the resize. Uh, when the the window when you get a surface or so on any window change, you need to create what's called a swap chain, uh, and you do that by calling a filament API called create swap chain. So that's basically just a wrapper for filament. Uh, it's our abstraction uh, because filament is multi-platform. You know, filament doesn't render into a surface directly; it renders into a swap chain. And on different operating system, that swap chain will accept. You know, instead of a surface, going to be whatever Windows uses or whatever macOS mm -hmm. uses. So the swap chain is just that that abstraction. Uh, so once you have that, the other objects you create uh, are pretty straightforward. So first, you create a filament engine. So you can think of the filament engine as just an instance of, let's say, OpenGL, right? Or, so that you could create only one engine for your entire app, right, across activities. Or if you create a list of, uh, I had a demo at Google where I created a list of uh, 3D objects in a, in a lazy column in, in, in Compose. And every item was was sharing the same engine. That way, you save a lot of memory and resources, right? Like you don't have to create multiple engines. Typically, we recommend no, create only one. Uh, then you create a renderer. So the renderer is going to be uh, that one's going to be more specific to like what you're rendering into. So for, for each surface, uh, you might want to have one renderer. Uh, so you create a renderer, and you create a scene. So the scene, you know, uh, obviously the name is pretty pretty obvious. That's where you're going to put uh, your meshes, your lights, uh, your skybox, you know, your background, stuff like that. So the scene is interesting because you can share the scene across multiple renderers. Uh, so that, that's what I was doing, for instance, I think in, the, in, in my IO demo. Or, you know, you can have multiple scenes if you have multiple renderers but the scenes can share the same objects inside. Like for instance, your lights can be the same, or maybe you have a mesh that's the same in all the scenes, but then you have an object that's specific to a scene. Uh, then the view, uh, it's it's really like, a... how can I describe the view? Uh, let me open this example. Uh, let me know if you have any, any questions. Uh, that's your sandbox. Gonna okay, uh, assets more and, uh, and I think it's the All right, so here this is just a uh, you know that helps us in our debugging, but uh, this is one of our sample apps, and you can see I have multiple views. Uh, so this is an at the top, that's an orth orthographic projection. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, then we have the same view showing the, like we, we have the same scene seen by different views. So you can see those two have the same camera, but this one has a different camera. So view 
is, is just that, right? Like it's kind of like a viewport, but they're all inside the, ren the same renderer. So a renderer can have multiple views. Uh, the UI that you have here, that's also a view. Um, most of the time you have only one view, but you know, it lets you do this kind of stuff. Uh, and then you need a cr to create a camera. Uh, so, you know, that's that's also pretty self-explanatory. Do you need a camera per each view or can you share uh, it? No, you can share the camera okay. as well. Uh, you, basically, in general, in the filament, like, except the, and even the render, technically, you can share it uh, because you, when you render, you, you tell it to render into a swap chain. Mm. Uh, so actually, I'll show you that code. So then uh, uh, with our choreographer, you know, when we schedule a frame, we get this callback. And uh, you call renderer.beginFrame, you give it the swap chain, uh, you give it the current time, so it's going to be very important to be able to do the dynamic resolution and the, uh, right. and the, the, the frame pacing. Would that also and, be used for animation or...? Uh, no, the animations, you drive them yourself, oh, or okay. when you use GRTF, we drive them for you. That's really just for the rendering. Um, so what's interesting about begin frame is that if you're sending frames too quickly because you know the, there's not enough uh, GPU to render what you're rendering, it will return false. When it returns false, it means hey, you should back off. Like you know, we are we are we have too many frames that are queued, so you should skip that frame. So it's like frame skipping. We, we take care of that for you. Mm. Um, if it says true, you just call render and you say okay, render that view. But you could do you know, if you have multiple views, you would you would render like all your views one after the other. Got it. Uh, and then you call end frame. Uh, so yeah, the renderer can be shared as well because you know you can render into a different uh, swap chain. Uh, so that's really uh, up to you. Anyway, so once you have that, uh, then you can do some setup on the view. The two things things that the view needs are the camera and the scene. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know the scene to just have a background. Like we we create a skybox, and uh, this is an API that just creates a, a solid kind of background. Uh, but inside, you can provide the texture to get, like, you know, the nice, nice texture background. And then on view, there's a lot of stuff you can set on view. So, uh, like, you know, you can set the bloom, you can set uh, the color grading, the depth of field, like all the features that we've seen before, like uh, the uh, stuff that, that was in the panel. Right. Yeah. Uh, you can set that here, right? Um, and and then there's other APIs that you can do picking. So if you get a, an X and Y coordinate, you can invoke a callback that will tell you what object that you clicked on. Um, anyway, so that's pretty simple. And then uh, we need to populate the scene. Uh, so in filament, everything is uh, an entity. Uh, so we have this entity manager, and when you call create on it, it creates an entity. What's interesting is that an entity is actually just an integer. Um, okay. And we provide this annotation uh, just, just to help you, like, you know, mark your your integers in your code to, to say okay this is a special integer right like it's kind of an object it's not really an integer it's is that a, like it's an ID entity. or it's an ID yeah okay um and and then what you do is that uh so everything's an entity the camera is an entity the lights are entities uh your meshes are entities uh but they're actually not entities they're components of an entity so here we create this entity right that we that we call renderable and then we have we have other managers. So, for instance, the renderable manager. That's how you create meshes. And you see at the end of of, of this uh, of this call, we said build. You know, we give it the engine and we give it the entity. So, what this is doing is it's creating a renderable component on the entity. So now the entity has the ability to render something on screen. But we also have the light manager, and same thing. The light manager builds a light component on an entity. So here it's a different entity. But you could build a light component on the same entity we created, right? So a great example is like if I have a, a, a lamp on the ceiling in my 3D scene, you know, I can have a 3D model as a renderable for the, for the lamp, and then I can assign it a light so that it's a mesh plus a light that, that lights the environment. Um, we also have the transform manager, so the you know, rotation, scale, translation. It's also a component that you set on an entity. So an entity is really this very generic thing, and you just add components to it to make it do interesting things. Uh, we have also a debug name component. That's literally just a string you can attach to an entity to, to be able to debug easily. Uh, and in the future, we may add more, more, more features that way. Mm. And so 
yeah, so when you want to create, um, let's look at the light, because you know, that's an easy one. So you, we create our entity, we use the light manager, we set the color of the light, it's a directional light, you set the intensity, the direction, we say we want to cast shadows. Then you, you build the component on the entity and then you add the entity to the scene. Uh, so that's kind of the programming model of film and that's always how, how you work. You have an entity, you build a component, you add the entity to the scene. Uh, for mesh, uh, so you use the renderable manager. Um, a mesh can be made of multiple what we call primitives. So here we create only one. So each primitive is basically a part of the mesh that has a material. So that can have a different shader, basically. So in our case, you know, it's just a triangle. So we have only one, one uh, primitive. But if you think about, um, I don't know, like uh, uh, I'm looking around me too, like my screen, right? You would have, I would have different, uh, maybe I would have three different uh, primitives, one for the screen itself. I would probably put some kind of texture with emissive light. I would have one for the plastic frame around it mm -hmm. and one for the metal base, right? You create three primitives. So a renderable uh, or mesh needs a bounding box. Uh, that's how we know like, if the, the, the object is on screen or not. Uh, that, you know, with GRTF that's taken care of for you, uh, we do have utility APIs that can compute the bounding box for you. Basically, you just take the, the mean and the max of all the triangles in your mesh. Mm. Uh, then you can set the geometry. So the geometry is really like the, the mesh data. It's the triangles. Uh, so here we set the geometry for the first primitive, primitive zero. We said that we have, that we have triangles. Uh, and we have other types of primitives like lines and points and stuff like that. Most of the time it's going to be triangles. Uh, you have to give a vertex buffer, an index buffer, so that's uh, really the vertex data that you want to that you want to uh, use. And then you give like an offset in the buffers, and then the number of of triangles uh, of vertices that you want. Uh, then you can set the material, uh, and we're going to look at materials in a bit. Uh, and the vertex and the index buffer. Uh, so if we look at it, it's a lot of code, but usually, usually you would not write, write it like this. It's because we build a triangle by hand. Yeah, uh, you would import actually, no. the OBJ file yeah. or whatever, right? It, it, yeah, exactly. Um, actually, here we're building a cube. Um, so the actual APIs are pretty simple. You create a vertex buffer. Uh, you say how many buffers of data you have inside, how many vertices you have inside. And then the mesh is made of attributes. The one attribute you always need is the position. So it's the X, Y, Z coordinate of each you know, vertex for your triangles. Uh, when you want to do lighting, you also need what's called tangents. So that's the normals. Uh, but you know, the attributes can also be the texture coordinates, the colors, stuff like that. Um, and, and basically, you give it you know, a byte buffer. Uh, so all that code that I have here is just you know, to be able to write my coordinates in the byte buffer. It's not very interesting. Uh, and again, usually you would not do it like this. So you would look at mesh loader to see how it reads that from a file. Uh, you'll see here it does the exact same thing, except mm -hmm. you know it has like position, tangent, color, texture coordinates. Um, and then you have your index buffer. So that's the indices of the triangle in the vertex buffer that you want to use for your mesh. Uh, and it, this is literally a list of of indices. So it's going to be zero, one, two, three, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's not very interesting, but you, know, you can look at it. It's not very complicated. Uh, and then you need the material. Um, so the material, um, so I showed you the, this, this tool that we use, MATC, so the material compiler, right? But what does it compile? So if we look at, uh, I have to switch to, sorry, the full ugly view that has way too much stuff. Uh, uh, it's my favorite view. I don't like it. It's too much stuff. <laughs> All right. So a mat file, or what we call a mat file, is kind of a JSON file. And I say kind of because uh, we made we call that JSON-ish. Uh, that's the actual term in the code. Because uh, we made JSON uh, JSON uh, easier to use. Like you don't need to have like the quote around the names and the and the values. Uh, you can put them, but you don't need them. And you can put uh, comments without it blowing up. Yeah, you can also have a trailing comma at the end. What? And so it's going to blow up. I know, I know. Wow. Um, so a material file is made of this two, this three sections. The first one is the mat what we call the material block. So that's all, that's everything that's documented uh, in, in this document here online. 
uh, and that describes, you know, it's like this says, okay, uh, okay I want okay. the uh, I want a lit material, right? And I want to create parameters that can be controlled by the app. So here I create a parameter called base color, and it's a, it's an array of three floats. I have the roughness, it's a single float, metallic, a single float. You can have textures. Uh, it's all here. Uh, it's all defined. Uh, where is it defined? I don't know. It's, it's all defined somewhere in here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, everything you need is, isn't that fine. Oh yeah, here you go. So you know you can have like booleans, vectors of booleans of integers. You can have matrices. You can have different types of textures. Um, anyway, it's all documented and every sample and every uh, feature as an as an example. Um, and then you have two other blocks. There's the fragment block, so that's the fragment shader, and you can have optionally a vertex block, so your vertex shader. Uh, and the, the fragment shader is a little different from what we've seen, you know, with the runtime shader in Android. So you need, you must implement this function here called material. It gives you a struct uh, as an input. Uh, it's also an output. You must call this function called prepare material. If you don't, you're going to get an error message, but it's going to tell you. And this structure is actually, you know, all the, the properties that we've seen in the, the UIs I showed you earlier, like, that's where you set the values. Uh, so I'm looking for it here. Uh, here we go. So it's documented here. So those are all the variables you can set. And if you don't set one of those variables, then we're going to you know, get rid of it in the shader code. So it's going to be free. If you use it, then the, uh, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. But that's where you say, OK, I want the base color to my object to be, in this case, you know, the base color that was given to me as a parameter. But if I wanted, I could say, like, how about I use, you know, a sign function of the current time, or, you know, it's a shader, right? You do whatever you want. In this case, I'm just passing directly the parameters I receive, uh, but we could modify it, like, you know, we could multiply the roughness by two, whatever we want. Uh, and so those are materials, right? For GRTF, we built a bunch of those for you, but if you want to create custom materials, that's how you do it. And then when you use the MATC tool, we're going to compile that into a bunch of shaders that, that film and can pass to OpenGL and, and Metal and all that. So once you have that, so typically, you know, you would, you would put the, 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 the compiled material in the asset directory of your app, and then you need to read it. So, you know, like here, I, 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 use, it, I use a file descriptor, you know, you read it in a byte buffer, you just need the byte data somewhere. And then we have this material builder API, uh, and you give it the bytes that contain the, the encoded material, and then you end up with a material object. Now, once you have that material object, that's where things become interesting. Uh, each material comes with a default instance, uh, so you can just set default instance, and you could use that as your material on your mesh. Uh, but in this case, we have parameters, right? So the default instance is going to use like default values, it's not going to be very interesting. So most of the time, what you want to do is you want to call create instance on the material that gives you a new instance. And an instance of a material, you can think of it as it's a bag of values for those parameters. So you know, we've created this lit material. It has a color, a roughness, and a metallic. Let's say we wanted a red plastic and a yellow metal. We'd create two instances. One would be like, you know, red, uh, I don't know, not rough and not metallic. And the other one would be yellow rough, and metallic. And in the code, you have those two instances. You can call set parameter uh, to, to be able to set those values. And then you can set those, those material instances on your objects. Uh, and that's how, for instance, if you want to swap the material of an object at runtime, you would just give it a different instance. Uh, that's how it works. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and then once you have that, you, know, you, you set your camera exposure. You tell the camera where it is and where it should look at. And that's all you need to start rendering with filament. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not as easy as Compose, uh, but <laughs> it's... Uh... So, I mean, now that you are, we are playing around with this, uh, the example, so if you, what, what happens if you run this sample? Just out of yeah. curiosity. Um, yeah, but so... I, want to, I want to understand, is it it's just going to... So I hope I've set up my so I'm in the film and source tree. So I think I have everything I need to compile. Will it? 
<laughs> no, no, it's it, it's it's comparable. It's, it's building. It's building. Oh, ah, here oh. yeah. I mean, Come it's on. it's a, it's a, it's more complex than your typical project. Uh, Darkness. All right, oh, here we go. Cube. Okay. Yeah. So this is you know a, a very simple example, right? Like, but. All that code to, to, to render a cube now, if we switch to, let's say, the, the examples that draw a textured object. So if we run the textured object sample, uh, you know, the setup is the same. We create the engine, the render, the scene, the view, the camera. Uh, we, we create our, uh, no, not textured, I'm looking at the wrong one, textured object, that's the one I want. Uh, so textured objects. So yeah, we do the same setup, right? The render, the scene, the view, the camera. Here we enable dynamic resolution, but that's that's going to be irrelevant. Uh, instead of a solid color, we set uh, a skybox as the background, and we have this IBL for the lighting. Um, so we you know we load other assets. Oh. That's what it looks like. Uh, we we load a mesh, so that fill a mesh I showed earlier, right? We, we use this function that comes from mesh loader uh, that gives you a mesh object that has a renderable, so it has everything you need. Uh, we just set a transform on it. Uh, so let's say, what happens if we do... I was hoping live edit would kick in, but apparently not. Uh... <laughs> this is not compose. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's live not, edit is kind of... It, it should, oops. I went the wrong way. Uh, I went to to look away from the. Um, yeah, so now we're further away from the object. There we go. Uh, but see, like you know, we still create the light. Like everything else looks very similar, right? Like we we just load the different uh, materials so that material the parameters text textures instead of uh, instead of just raw numbers. So I use we use this load texture utility function that Firmin provides uh, to load bitmaps from our drawable directory. It's gonna you know it's gonna convert them into Firmin texture objects. So it's very very similar uh, to to the example of the triangle. So once you understand the triangle, it's not that that of a stretch to switch to a more complex example uh, where things become a little different. That when you use the GLTF viewer, so Actually, you know what? We'll be able to use, uh, since it's our sample. Mm -mm. Remote control? Yeah. Oh. Uh, so I just need to run the ADB command. Uh, of the course. Tutorial? Why don't I really? have ADB? Okay. Uh, yeah, don't Platform usually... Platform tools? Yeah, I always forget where it is. Yeah, okay. Oh. So now connect. Yeah, we're connected. So see now I have I have control over everything here. I can move the light. Uh, I can change the color grading. Let's see. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of weird to have filament rendering in the browser to control filament rendering over there. <laughs> There we go. See, we can change the color grade. It's pretty fast too, right? Like it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's actually. Damn. You know, you can cool. enable dynamic resolution. Uh, so yeah, and this is an example of screen space reflections. Yeah, so see, it froze a little bit because we changed variant of shaders, so it had to recompile the shaders. Uh, anyway, so this is an example of a of a of a GLTF with an animation. Uh, yeah. And. To load the GLTF, so if we look at the code, it's actually even easier because we have something called the model viewer that does uh, a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So you know, you create your model viewer, you give it a surface view, uh, and uh, and then here we set a bunch of options to turn on like you know anti-aliasing and dynamic resolution and all that stuff. Uh, by default, we load the GLTF from uh, inside the app. And then on the model viewer, you could load model GLTF async. You give it the buffer, and that's pretty much it. That's all you have to do. Uh, you know, we set up the lighting ourselves. But what's cool is that if I go to uh, with the remote control, um, if I go to environments, if I take I don't know like this HDR, 
look at that, change the lighting. God damn it. And, yeah. Nice. <laughs> or if I, you know, if I go back here and I drop a GLB, boom, now I have my uh, Iron Man. Okay, yeah. so w w where is the... Um... The saving not happening, so I can add do the PR. <laughs> uh, no, so that's that's a different tool. That's uh, okay, okay, that, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I always forget how. To, I think uh, I think I have to enable a compare time option, and it's, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, but it's, it's documented somewhere in the source tree. Uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So and you know and uh, and so loading and you can see like you know th this this app has the code like you receive a message from the remote server so it tells you hey I would like you to load this GRTF or this HDR file so it, it has a bit of code to make that happen you can also load zip files uh, but that's specific to this app right you don't have to do all of this but you know it's pretty simple like the you know the code to like sure. set up I... filament no but the code to set up I filament like, and, like and, and render simple. the GRTF. Well, I mean, look, we're, we're talking about what, uh, no, no, no. 160, 160 lines it's, of code? It's definitely unfamiliar, but I, I get what you mean. I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, I guess if you're talking about the, the setup, it's mostly boilerplate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's all, and the reason why that boilerplate is still there, it's because, you know, most of the time it feels like, oh, you're doing the same thing over and over again. But then there will, there, there's a lot of cases where you actually want to do you know, let's say you want to do a recycle view of those renderers, then you cannot need it to be boilerplate because you need mm -hmm. that level of control. Yeah. Uh, so, and you can always build, you know, you can always, uh, you can always build your own utilities uh, uh, on top of it uh, to make it, to make it easier to use. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the gist of it. And, you know, this is kind of nice to like help you like tweak the scene, figure out like, okay, what do I want my lighting to be? And once you have the values you're happy with, then you can put them in your code so that your scene you know, is, uh, is the way you like it. Um, nice. Nice, nice, okay. nice. It's actually very, very handy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, tools are always good, right? Always good to have. Look, depth of field. Fair enough. Well. Uh, <laughs> well. Yeah. This is really cool. Really, yeah. really cool. Uh, and I also have so the sample is a bit whole old by now, but uh, so it's called. I have two samples. It's one called sample uh, materials shop. So that's something I showed at Google I/O. So that was this example. Ah, right. Um, so it, right, it's composed. Uh, every item is a different, you know, for rendering, but they share the engine and so on. And they would let you like you could change the change the color of the object in real time. Um, so that one is interesting because I didn't use I used GRTF, but I didn't use this model viewer. I wrote my own that does a little less. So it's a good example of like it's kind of a minimal example. There's something there's not a ton of code. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's really uh, what's the main activity? Uh, and then it shows you how you handle filament inside the uh, compose. So the APIs have changed. On commit doesn't exist anymore, but uh, that's what uh, side effects, uh, something like this, mm -hmm. or launch effect. Uh, but this shows you how to you know, to do those to do those things. Uh, that's a good example. And then I have another one called uh, what's it called? A oh, wake me up. Uh, yes. uh, wake me up. So this one doesn't use GRTF, but uh, it uses filament again in a compose list to render uh, the sky on the GPU based on the time you give it. Um, so as you move the slider, you will see the sun rise and, and go down and the, the sky Is that changes. Like a, sort of... Just a fancy shader or? Oh yeah, it's a very fancy shader. So here's the material, uh, you know. So you, you could theoretically run this uh, as a AGSL shader, or is it too much? Uh, yeah, you could. Uh, you, you very much could. Uh, but AGSL didn't exist uh, when I built this. Yeah, yeah, I imagine but that yeah, was the reason. But yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you could. Uh, you, you very much could. So yeah, now, now, but you know, if you need to run on older versions of Android, then you know, you can you can use this. Uh, yeah. And something like it does kind of like minimal uh, minimal setup where it renders a single triangle uh, to draw the 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 sky, so you can see like here it's creating the mesh. It's pretty simple uh, compared to what we saw. So yeah, I have a few samples that show you how to use uh, how to use filament. Um, 
but yeah it's uh that's that's kind of a tour of what you can do with filament uh there's a lot of features in, in the apis uh most of it should be at least there should be javadoc um, or you can use it from c plus plus if you prefer or from or from javascript sure. You know, we sure. say that friends don't don't talk to uh, other friends about C plus <laughs> plus. Ah, it's 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 not so bad. At least the C plus plus we we use in filament uh, doesn't try to be too smart, uh, so it tends to be readable. Uh, I don't know if I can find let me find an, an example. If you if you ever want to look at the source code, it shouldn't be too scary. Uh, I think the shaders are are more scary than than the. Uh, yeah, like the color grading, right? Like this is the code that does like all those fancy effects that we saw, uh, you know, like um, white balance, mixing the channels, contrast, saturation, vibrance. Uh, if you look at the code, it's, you know, it's not quite clean, but it's also not yeah, it's crazy readable. looking. It's just, yeah, I, it's I okay. never know if I, what I'm reading is actually what I think it is I'm reading. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's that sometimes. Uh, but again, like, you know, or you look at code like this, right? Like, it's, it looks very much like a class with mm -hmm. functions and methods and fields. It's overall, there are parts of filament that are, uh, let's see if I can remember where is that one. So I work with this other French guy, Matthias, who's really good at C. And he's very good at not abusing C, but he, he can also do some pretty, crazy magic uh, with C++, and I'm trying to remember where he puts uh, and buffer, I guess some, yeah, that's where we, we, sometimes we have stuff like this, where this is using like virtual memory pages and exceptions to like manage memory correctly, uh, or you know, there's like, there's a lot of like macro processing trick uh, with like varied Jesus templates Christ. and yeah. So, but we try to keep those to like, you know, the areas where they're actually needed. Uh, yeah, not... here, here be dragons kind of package. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where is the, I'm trying to, oh yeah, like stuff like that. Don't ask me. Like, sure. <laughs> It looks like the, the code is what? is like I uh, that's that's a type name args I guess. <laughs> that, yeah, what's that's, with the dots? Oh, sorry, that's that, dots. that's 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 actually uh, not too bad. That's variety templates. So uh, you know when you put a template on a method, this basically says there's n types that are coming, and and what you do is that it's a recursive template so it's it's kind of like have you ever uh, used prolog no no okay well anyway so yeah it's <laughs> uh you basically it's basically you're given a stack of templates and you you call the the methods that call each other until you end up to, uh, on a template that's a, a list of one template and then it stops so um, you're playing multi-dimensional chess trying to understand yes. uh, what that does yeah, this, <laughs> ah Oh. And my, comp my yeah, my computer. I have to restart my computer. It's the GPU just locked up. I think it's a good time to wrap up then, because <laughs> we're, we're almost an hour over time. <laughs> okay. Well, right now I'm staring at a green screen, so yeah, I, I we kind of have to wrap up. <laughs> we're we're staring at the black one, so don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> so, so I want to I want to thank you. People in the chat were happy. Uh, I I enjoyed the the episode. <laughs> And I, uh, I think we we can do this more, uh, like forever, because <laughs> because there's so much stuff. Uh, so thank you for coming, Roma. Thank you yeah, very much. It's always a always a pleasure. And uh, so do we want do we want to turn off the camera? So it sounds like a podcast now. You know which. <laughs> yeah, but then I would have to talk and, very close to the microphone. You yeah, know? very <laughs> late, late night DJ voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Sebastiano, I, I want just to quickly uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, remember that you can support us with Twitch, uh, on Twitch, on Coffee, and on, uh, on our shop. I will leave the links in the description, just to keep it very short. And Sebastiano, spoilers, 
Uh, next week, we have Yen Lake, and we're going to be talking about navigation, uh, in Compose, and type safety. Uh, and then we are taking a few weeks off because I'm going to be traveling and uh, hopefully taking a lot of pictures. And then we'll be back in uh, May with a very special non-Android episode. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea I, I because hope, I never looked at the calendar. I hope it's good. And yeah, we'll see. There's going to be swing involved. That's, okay, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as long as you uh, as long as you you uh, advertise my uh, swing book or the book that Chet and I wrote. <laughs> yes, <laughs> filthy rich clients and. <laughs> so can we have a discount code for our audience? <laughs> gonna ask Chet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who knows what he's gonna say? <laughs> okay. See you all next week. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Thank Roman, you. for this super interesting episode. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing a lot of people using filament now. Have a great mm -hmm. one, everyone. Bye. Ciao, ciao.